Yes. Hey, look at that. Everybody's in. There's already people in here. Let me pull up your, uh, let me pull up your stream, Eric, so I may read the chat. Anybody see that Many Saints of Newark trailer? That's the Sopranos prequel trailer. You guys hear about that? No. Good? Uh, yeah. They... Forget it. Is that what you said? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Sopranos prequel trailer, it's called uh, Many Saints of Newark. Yeah, but you're saying forget it, it's bad? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just asking if you guys have seen it. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, oh, oh. No, I have not. I saw people excited about the fact that it's a thing. Okay, but all right. I, but I wasn't a Sopranos person, so I just didn't pay attention. Me neither. There are two shows that I missed. Um, the Wire and Sopranos, like, like they yeah. just, I didn't, I didn't hop on when they were hot. And then so many years have gone by. I'm just like, I'm like, I feel like it's a little late. I am the same. I once had a German try to exp uh, while I was in Germany at a at a like event uh, try to explain um, the wire and his enthusiasm <laughs> for the wire in this like wow. like whatever the whatever the German equivalent of Spanglish is oh my god that's hilarious yeah and he's just like he's getting really enthusiastic and animated and telling me like there's this one scene and they just say fuck 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 and he's <laughs> cracking up and he's like and it's so good and i'm like oh okay man that's a was this at a convention uh i was i was there for a whole like event signing thing there was no actual convention it was it was like kind of a tour of signing for stores and doing some press so. he was sort of my translator and sort of the guy so the guy who was my like official handler from the publisher didn't live in berlin anymore and couldn't drive and so he didn't have like any way to get me places and he didn't remember where everything was so he's like but that's okay I've got this friend who also works for the press and we've promised that as long as he gets like a one-on-one -on -one interview with you, he'll get to be the, like the tour guide and liaison and translator and yada, yada. So this other guy filled in in that way. And that's the one who was telling me about the wire. You guys keep talking. I'm going to, I'm going to tell people that we're live. Tell them, tell, tell away. Let them know. Do you find those uh, events like that? Does it does it uh, does this stress you out doing them? <laughs> In general, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, every event has some level of stress, of course. Sure, sure, sure. But um, in general, no. That Germany trip was stressful, um, and it's just lots of weird specifics. Like Anything that. you can get into or? Uh, not before Eric starts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, I mean we'll come back to it. It was just stuff like um, there's always a disconnect between English and German in terms of like mm. other sensibilities. Um, so I would tell jokes that just didn't, and just like not jokes like I'm setting up a punchline, but just you know joking around kind of stuff. And it's yeah. obvious they do not get that you're joking. Uh, yeah, you're just being jovial. Or or just, like, weirdly inappropriate, or, you know. You were being yeah. weird, weirdly inappropriate? I wasn't. I was joking. Um, uh -huh. and it just, like, it, kind of like regular joking. Like, you know, yeah. I'm just being a little silly while we're hanging out. And then, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the Germans who were showing me around, or just Germans in general that I was around, were, were not picking up on the humor side. Yikes. Welcome to the show, everyone. Oh, yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you know, all Eric is still doing his thing. Hello, Atomic Bulldog. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Eric Bonham. Hello, El Padrino. Hello. All right, that's that. Ja He's all super Japanese official person. and everything. Hello, Japanese person. <laughs> it's very welcoming, Michael. 
a little Japanese person. Dave, All right, you, let me get to chat Dave, and then we can start either... drawing and chit chatting. <laughs> Here we go. Can either of you read kanji? <laughs> I cannot. How do I pronounce my surname? Kaneti. C A N E T E. For easy translation in my username, it's Hebrew Jewish. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Atomic Bulldog. Good. Good evening to you. Mr. Dave Peterson is joining me in chat right along with my uh, the Batman to my Robin, the Thelma to my Louise, the Oats to my Meal, hey. Mr. Michael <coughs> Nicola. Hello, Nikki. How are you? The Good Eric and Mr. Eric Bonehome. How are you? El Padrino. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Three smiling faces in a row. Unfortunately, I can't read your name, but hello. Thank you for being here. Greg Moran, hello. John Amore. John Amore's late. I just want everybody to know that. John Amore's late with my deadline. It's disappointing. Yeah, let's shame him. <laughs> we, we were late too, though, weren't we? One hundred percent. No, no, no. De deadline, yes. deadline-wise, you're you guys are, are you, doing, you guys are doing just fine. John Amore's way behind, and it's most disappointing when it comes from him because he's normally the guy that rides your ass when you're late. So when he's late, oh my gosh, it's doubly, it's doubly sinful. Should we, should we give them a little context? In what sense? No, no, why? Uh, just shame oh. him. <laughs> shame. Guys, you don't need to know the context. Just know that John Moore is late and uh, he deserves your shame. <laughs> yeah, I know. Jokes aside, so in the, in the, I'm gonna start drawing. I'm just gonna bring this iPad up and we're just gonna chit chat. So in the, um, as a, as a premium for the people who early adopt to my forthcoming crowdfunding campaign sometime in uh, sometime in first or second week of September, depending on what we when we officially launch, but definitely September. Early adopters, X amount of hours, I think it's the first 48, Mike, I can't remember what we had decided on, mm -hmm. but X amount of hours yeah. in um, first two days, yeah, first two days of the campaign, everybody gets um, exclusive trading cards. And um, because I like your guys' art, I reached out to you individually and said, hey, would you mind coming up with these sort of 90s tribute t style um, trading cards, like the kind of you'd find in Wizard Magazine and all those other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, era appropriate um, uh, images, promos, right? And you guys were pretty enthusiastic about it, you know? And I saw you Love trying it. to, I asked you and I asked Dave and I asked John and Dave was well on his way. And I think it was a couple of days ago when you guys kind of conferred and said, hey, so how, how close are you to being done? To which John Amore yes. said, I didn't think it was due until September. <laughs> the bum. That is exactly what he said. The bum who doesn't put me on his freaking calendar. His, one of, if, if not one of his best friend, his best friend. All right. I guess I'll get over that disappointment. It's going to be easier because Dave Peterson is here. Hello, Dave. Hello. Thank you so much Dave for your time. Dave makes everything easier. I think so. So guess what, Mike? I was I was chit chatting with Dave 15 minutes into the show, you know, before the stream. And for whatever sure. reason, I had made massive assumptions that I knew something about him and his product, to which he said, <laughs> No, Eric, that's actually off. That's off by a lot. Oh. And oh, I was shit. like, huh. Not, not like in a bad way. No, like, no, no, no. But so I love being wonderfully wrong because because I get to learn all about it. I feel like I'm getting an opportunity to learn about it again, you know? So at okay. first we were talking about, you know, um, uh, I had I introduced the idea that somewhere I had read that Dave had been, so when he had uh, published Mouse Guard, he was going to, um, he had found a way to distribute it through a local comic book store. He corrected it and he said it's not inaccurate, but that wasn't necessarily the story. Dave, can oh, you go over that okay. again? The very, the, the just that very beginning yeah. part that you were talking about. Yeah, I, I self-published the first issue of Mouse Guard just because that was the only way I thought I would be able to get a comic out. Um, took it to my local comic convention. It was print on demand, so they, you know, cost them a leg. I mean, I could still sell them, hand sell them to the final owner, but I couldn't, like, distribute them in any way. And I, there were a couple stores there um, at that local show who were like, oh, would you would you wholesale, you know, 10 copies to us for our store? We, we like this book. And I, I was like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And I don't think <laughs> I discount this because I paid too much for it right um, and uh, and then I was getting ready to do the next issue that was in uh, May of 2005 and then in July of 2005 I went to San Diego the San Diego Comic Convention just to like just wander around and see the spectacle and meet other fans and of things and and like 
meet Mike Mignola and get signatures and stuff like that. That's what, that was my plan. I bumped into a guy who knew me from the local show and he was like, I know why you're here. You're trying to get mouse guard set up at a publisher. I was like, Nope. <laughs> who wants this dumb, uh, square book about mice? You think Marvel right. wants that? You think DC wants that? And he was like, no, but a smaller publisher might. And then he recommended Archaea and uh he said the name of someone who was uh, who founded archaea uh, mark smiley and i knew mark smiley from several years before um and mark had given me a really good portfolio review for um the, just like an illustration portfolio that i'd shown him um and i don't mean good like he had nothing but good things to say i mean like good like it was really helpful and thoughtful and uh so I just thought, I'll, I'll show this to, yeah, I'll walk over to that Archaea booth. I'll show this to Mark. He's going to give me some pointers about what I could be doing better on my book. But that's probably about as far as this is going to go. And he went, let's publish this book together. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. At, after showing wow. it to him, like, once, right? Like, after... Yeah. But you had already established a you relationship know, with, with him, though, right, Dave? What's that? You you had already established a relationship with him. You kind of already had once at another convention. We weren't we weren't like fast friends. I didn't really have contact information for him. There was there was no like yeah there there was no out of convention talk. I, I right. approached him uh, at a convention and, and chatted with him, and he he did remember me from then. But yeah, we there was no like friendship. I was looking through your website, and by the way, if you haven't visited, um um. Dave Peterson's website. It is mouseguard.net. Am I am I representing that well, Dave? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Mouseguard. I went and looked at it earlier today, and there's a lot of publications there. But I think there was of by way of story, right? By way of like graphic novel, mm -hmm. minus the comic. Excuse me, my, minus the coloring book. And I think there was an alphabet book in there as well. Correct. Yep. Brilliant. That's brilliant. It's such a great marketing. It's it fits so well within your brand. Um, but I saw that there were six books. Six volumes? So Five. there's three volumes in the main series. Mm -hmm. Fall, Winter, and Black Axe. Okay. And then we did um, the Legends of the Guard spinoff anthology where guest artists came in and told tall tales and legends. Mm -hmm. I draw um, kind of the linking scenes so mm -hmm. that all the mice are in a tavern telling tall tales to... Uh, uh, try to clear their bar tab. I draw all those tavern scenes, but as soon as a mouse starts their story, that's where it's a guest. And you you did one of those in volume two. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those stories. So we, Thank we you have very three much. volumes of that. And then um, we have a short story collection of my short comics that were like free comic book day style uh, sampler stories, like little eight page samplers to get you into mouse guard we collected a bunch of those and put those in a, a short story collection called baldwin the brave and other okay. tales so that's the that's the meat of the series everything else is um supplement kind of stuff dude that's a lot there are guys out there doing self-publishing stuff that doesn't that are, that is nowhere near that man they're not in spitting distance of the stuff that you've managed to publish now we were talking earlier this is a two decades right yeah, again i can't get credit <laughs> for being a self-publishing guy because I self-published one issue. One issue. I don't know about you know, that. Is it is like I, I think I think the way you say it, it's diminishing the idea that, you know, some guys have published the one issue but don't have the same sort of longevity as you. You know? Oh sure, you, sure. I mean yeah. 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 That's in that's fat, that's the part to me that is I mean of the many things that I admire about your tenacity that one is probably top three where you found the thing that you it's obvious that you that you have a real passion for it right and you said I'm going to continue to do this right one of the things that right. I'd always uh, wanted to ask you was that was there ever anything else in your sort of you know that the target reticle for the lack of a better term that you wanted to do was it always mouse guard I guess. Right? Was it always like no. I have stories and and it's and it's this? You're saying no. Yeah, no. I mean, I I had so the, there's a this is a great segue tie-in for uh, my video podcast series, Derek. Yeah. Um, which is called the Plot Masters Project. So when I was a in high school, um, several friends and I like to toy with the idea of like, what if we made our own comics? Yeah. And some of them were people who. who 
tended to come up with story ideas. Some of them were other artists. Some oh, of them. Sorry. That's okay. Um, but anyway, we 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 made this little like you know fake comic book publishing company that never made anything, <laughs> right. really, other than concept designs. Um, and we called ourselves the Plot Masters. And yeah. Between uh, the the main other guy Jesse Glenn, my best friend, he's uh, the the character of Kenzie in the comics is based on Jesse. Um, Jesse and I, between the two of us, came up with about probably 30 unique IPs during that time. Jesus. Holy crap. I mean, we, we liked sitting around and drawing. There was probably like a decade between being in, in high school and being in college and in that in that range where, um, yeah, I mean, we, we would like sitting around and drawing the Ninja Turtles or sitting around and drawing our favorite X-Men, but we sure. would also go like, what if we made a superhero team that had a history and a, and a lineup, an ever-changing lineup like the X-Men. What would right. our thing be? And then we were never creating them to fit into the X-Men. They weren't going to be recruited by Xavier or anything like that. It yeah. was our own thing. Or, you know, w let's take everything we like about Ninja Turtles and make our own thing. Let's take everything we like about Robotech and make our own space opera. Sure, sure. Um, and yeah, between some of them were things that were purely his, some of them were purely mine, and some of them we worked on together. And like I said, together, I think there was about 30 total. Um, so the Plotmasters project is now us as adults going back and looking at those and sharing all the old embarrassing artwork um, with you guys. But also we, we redesign and redraw uh, just a single image, almost like a cover or a pinup of that thing of like, how would we treat that today? Yeah. So yeah. there were a lot of things like that, but obviously because some of those were Jesse's, mm -hmm. though, like when, when it comes time to do Mouse Guard, you know, or when it comes time to do something, and yeah. for me it happened to Mouse Guard. Yeah. Um, all the things that were Jesse's, uh, you know, there's I, those are hands off, I can't touch those. Sure, sure. And even the things that were ours, that gets a little precarious. Like, sure, sure. Are we are we gonna work together on this, or am right. I gonna do this thing on my own? And at the time that I stepped out and did Mouse Guard, part of it was out of frustration of either waiting for other people or waiting for opportunities to happen. Mm, I was like, mm. this isn't gonna happen unless I just start making pages. Like I don't need to. I don't need anybody else that I can blame for not getting a script in on time, not getting something colored on time, sure. having a disagreement over story with. If it's just me. Mm -hmm. And then it fails, and I don't get it done. I can only be mad at myself. But if it sure. gets done, sure, awesome. I got something accomplished finally. You know? <laughs> so, um, so I kind of figured that us working on something together probably wouldn't be good. Also, so then when I looked at all the things that were just mine, Mouse Guard was the thing, yeah, that was the best. Like it was the it was the best idea that I had. Right on. There right were on. other things there that could have been fun. But none of them seemed like I just wasn't as passionate about the others, or or they just didn't feel like they had legs. Sure, they were too sure. Yeah, abstract. yeah. I think when you're when you're coming up with stories in your head, there are these premises that seem promising, but really you haven't dedicated enough sort of mental energy into like turning it into a long form narrative. You kind of go like, oh, that's cool because it has robots and it has monsters, right. but it doesn't go anything beyond that. There's nothing you know, substantial there that you can turn into whatever X amount of chapters. But then apparently, I mean, it's obvious that you had something to do, you had something more with Mouse Guard to go, I think I can turn that into, how many pages was the first volume? The first, like the first hardcover? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's 192 pages, but that Jeez. includes like table of content. And all yeah, but still, um, it's 190 it's 20, some odd. Uh, it's like 24 pages over six issues. So, yeah. Yeah. So you had six five, issues yeah. worth of a story to tell, right? Well, uh, no. No? <laughs> I mean, tell I me. That first, I did that first issue, that first self published issue. Mm -hmm. really was like a litmus test like can i do this yeah that's awesome i, I think i can i want to um yeah. i had already got our mutual friend jeremy bastion sure had encouraged me to go to that local convention 
which I had gone to, that convention ran twice a year. So I had gone to the fall one um, and set up next to him and actually shared a table with another guy, a third guy. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeremy had really encouraged it. At first when Jeremy's like, oh, you should go to this convention with me. I was like, but I don't have a comic. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a comic and I've been setting up there for the last six years. <laughs> and I was like, okay. oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, right. How much is it for a half table? 50 bucks? Yeah, I'm in. I was going to go to this convention anyway and pay 20 at the door for a day. Why not right. pay 50? Right. What, what was the value in that for you, Dave? Would you say it was just for the experience of having a table and sitting behind and operating yeah. as a vendor? Or what? where, where was your brain on that? It was, my brain on that one was, so like I said, part of it was just the bargain. Like I looked at it as oh, right, right. if I wanted to for one day, it was like 18 or 20 bucks. If I wanted to get in for the whole weekend and have a place to sit, it was $50. Right, <laughs> was like, right, okay. right. That's value added. But I thought like, this is my chance to see if people are interested in my work besides the people who are, you know, loved ones who sure, obviously right. are gonna, you know, be positive about your work. But you're like, is there wider appeal beyond grandma and grandpa? And, now know, at that point friend. on your table, did you have anything Mouse Guard related at all? Or was it just like a, uh, like a, so a I, collection of your work? Yeah, I, tr I treated it like I put together a portfolio that was mostly originals, a few pieces that were prints that I literally printed out on my home, like inkjet printer. I'm into they it. Like, they were just, yeah. you know, things that I printed out and right. I would sell these prints really cheap or I had the originals for sale and it was a Swiss army knife, like scattershot approach to, yeah. look, I can do this. I can also do this. Yeah. I can do watercolors. I can do pencil rendering. I can do ink. I can do superheroes. I can do talking animals. I can do <laughs> sure. D and D characters. It was all over the place and a terrible portfolio, really, because of that. Right. Because it was it was like the worst version of the jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after the show, yeah, it was like, after like, the show, you. Guy, look, this guy's showing off how he's not accomplished at anything. <laughs> Wow. But it did. But you did manage to. I mean, by, after all was said and done, you did manage to go, to to get what you wanted out of it, which is you yeah. wanted to have so, the experience. Well, savings first, but obviously the experience of sitting behind a table, right? Yes. Well, and I I thought I was going to get commission work out of it. I thought like having the sampler would be enticing, where somebody goes, "Oh, I like this superhero. Could you do a painting or a sure. drawing like that for me?" Sure. Or, "Oh, I like these talking animals. Could you do?" This? And I didn't really get commissioned, but I had a bunch of people who saw some of the mouse designs in my portfolio and asked, "When does this book come out?" Wow. Okay. Mm. Cool. People, I was like, "No, there's no book. It's not a book. It's, a, <laughs> right. it's just drawing for a thing, an idea I have." And it's, you know. And then after like the third person asked, when does this book come out? I'm like, I'm missing a trick. This is yeah. my, I should not answer. There's no book. Yeah, so I just yeah, said, yeah. Uh, I'm getting the issue ready. The first issue will be out at the next, <laughs> uh, the next convention, which at that point was six months away. I'd like just started a clock. So yeah, you, so at the show you had decided, hey, I'm getting enough really great feedback about this thing that I'd never made a plan about. And yeah, six months from now, I'm going to have a book out. Yeah. That's well, freaking issue. awesome. Yeah. Wow. Or an issue, an issue. Yeah. That is an freaking issue. awesome. You, is you, awesome. you basically put yourself in a pressure cooker, Dave. Yeah. And I, ha and, and really when you think about it, like drawing 24 pages in six months doesn't sound like a pressure cooker. For some people it is. Well, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, if you've never drawn a comic before. Yeah, exactly. When you've never yeah. really done it before. Right. I had drawn some pages here and there. Right. But I had never to told a, a story, even if it's just a chapter, that yeah. has like, you know, beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not as what easy as it looks, right? It's not as conceptually, when you have it in your hand, already kind of done from somebody else, you go like, Oh yeah, of course I can polish it here and there. And the reason why I bring that up, I, I'm getting a little chuckle on the inside and we'll get back to your story really, really quick. But yeah. I see a lot of crowdfunding guys who are trying it now and what an amazing environment that we're in, you know, to contrast it to what you were talking about. You said, oh my gosh, it cost me an arm and a leg to get this thing print on demand. And now we're in an environment in sort, in, in sort of in a situation in which if, if you had these kinds of resources available to you back then, 
imagine the sort of uh, you know the, the the next level of opportunity you may have had leveraged for yourself, right? But what I think sure. what people have a tendency to to lose track of is that independent of the campaign, which is re- it's, it can get really super exciting, you can get really caught up in how you know successful it is and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, there still is the, the task and the craft of making the comic book. And I know a handful of people who are ill prepared to go into that space. Sure, they see the comic. And then you ask them like, why did you make these panel to panel decisions in your narrative? And they can't answer you, you know, because they just see, oh, it's a cool picture, but it doesn't really, doesn't really make much sense by way of flow and storytelling, you know? So that's why I'm getting a, a chuckle out of it, you know, to, to think that yeah. well, I mean, it's happened to the best of us, you know? And those are people who I assume have some experience and maybe they just in a rush made bad decisions or because they're in their own echo chamber made bad yes. decisions, sure. panel arrangement. Sure. When you've, when you've never done it, there's also just the like, can you get to 24 pages? Like the most mean? pages I've ever drawn. I, I, I had a couple of cool college professors who let me do some like um, graphic novel or comic style presentations um, sure. by, by drawing like a mini comic instead of turning in a, a paper. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had drawn, you know, like four, six consecutive pages, um, but they weren't really narrative. They were almost gimmick. And um, and yeah, like four or six pages or whatever. When you're like, I need to draw 24 pages. The characters <laughs> need to be recognizable. Right all the way through, even though I'm going to develop as an artist, I'm going to start finding shortcuts on like page 12 for how to draw these guys. It's going to like suddenly change how I'm drawing. (laughs) You were doing, you were doing that by page 12. You're already coming up with like, you know, uh, short or shorthand for the characters that you develop. Really? Or or, or things where like you draw while you're sketching something out, you draw a character's eye a little smaller during a, like while you're penciling it and you're like, sure, that looks good. Yeah. That, it looks better than it did on page three. <laughs> All right, shit. I'm gonna draw the eye a little smaller from now on. Right, right. And in span of what do you think? In the span of 24 pages, did you see such a a change due to growth and or sort of preference in the in the way that you were drawn? Sure. Yeah. I feel like that happens almost every issue I do. <laughs> okay. There's still. Wow. still Thing let me say hello. Stuff. Let me say hello to everybody in chat. Hello, uh, yeah. Jasper Plan Nine. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Emiliano Lemos. Hello, Eric. Greetings from Argentina. Hello, Argentina. Thank you for joining us. Um, what about good ahoy, good sir? Best camera in the biz. I think that's that's you, Mike. Best camera in the biz. He says. Oh, well, how are you, man? You. Thank you for joining us. Fuyuki. Hello, everyone. Hello to you. And I am Mac. He's saying, good evening, all finally made alive. Thank you so much for being here. We are joined by uh, the uh, artist and author of Mouse Card, Mr. David Peterson. He's uh, regaling us of stories of how he ended up to being becoming the success that he is. So if you've got a minute to listen, I'm going to try to ask him really good questions. But I also encourage you, to, if you have any questions for David, to please ask in chat, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Sorry to cut you out, Dave. Go ahead. You're saying you, uh, you by, in the time that you've drawn, you, you're oh, still doing yeah. it now, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think as an artist, you should be. There's going to be, there's going to be growth that's positive and even growth that's negative. Um, yeah. You know, you, you get your own like, um, unfortunate like positive feedback from from bad decision making. Like, oh, that felt easier, so it was good. And then you look back at it and you're like, well, that's actually because I rushed through that drawing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The reason why it kind of trips me up. Now it freaks me out, but it trips me out because I'm such a huge stickler for consistency. You know, like not necessarily model sheet version, animation version of consistency, although that's probably where it comes from in my in my pedigree of working in animation. But certainly, like if I'm going to draw something who's, you know, like I say, a character whose eyes are X amount of, you know, wide apart, right? I try to maintain that all throughout, independent of my own sort of like personal tastes as I reach. 10 pages in. So to hear you say that, it kind of makes me go, oh, look at that. That's a different approach to everything, you know? Which is great. I mean, I, I try to do that. You know, I, I realize that stuff happens. Like, and and to fight it is in some ways like fighting your own artistic growth. Hmm. But yeah, that, like that consistency stuff, like, 
uh, things that drive me nuts are I'll realize like oh I forgot to draw this character's you know uh, belt in this oh, sure. in this like sure sure they have a ba- belt on the last page and now they have a belt in this panel but there's three panels in between where I forgot to draw a belt or yeah. a, you know mm-hmm. or their sword in or I forgot to put their earring in or I forgot to put you know whatever their thing is and be like oh so you're talking about primarily just like something that has come to you that's it's somehow it feels better than the previous way that you've drawn it not necessarily because you missed a belt but because you like this is a bad example but like oh i i suddenly feel like i can draw fur better by the time i get to this panel but that's not exactly how i drew the fur nine nine pages ago nine panels ago yeah yeah i mean if you're doing the pages in order the growth should be subtle there shouldn't unless you like set down everything and come back to it a year later. There shouldn't be like a jump where it's going to be totally jarring for the audience. Mm. Mm. You know, they 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 could notice it, especially if they look at on that first issue of Mouse Guard, especially like the first time that you see the main character mice on I think it's page three. Yeah. Um, you know, those Saxon, Kenzie, and Liam. When you when you see them on page three, and then you see them in the middle of the book, and then the end of the book, you're like, oh, these look different. <laughs> But that's craft wise. Craft wise is because you were growing. Craft wise is because you were yeah. sort of building up your repertoire of how to render them, right? Like you kind of you start getting more and more comfortable with drawing your own characters, which is a weird thing to say, right? Yeah. But it's not it's not any less true. Which is like these are your characters. You're supposed to know how to draw them. But by the time you get five, ten pages in, you start understanding the the little isms that allow you to draw them more enjoyably. I don't know if it's the same for you, yeah. right? Yeah. And some of it's stuff like, I mean, with, with Mouse Guard, because the characters only have little black beady eyes, I don't have mm-hmm. the, the white of the eye. So like mm-hmm. doing any kind of expression where a character is rolling their eyes or looking off to the side, yeah. they don't have eyebrows. Like I lose a lot of controls um, that other artists with other characters might have. So a lot of it comes down to like this kind of body language, this overall body language. Yeah. And there was now, stuff you... like the, the short there that I was finding also, where it was like, oh, I I can, if I make Kenzie just a little taller than yeah. I've been drawing and, and tend to draw him a little more vertical, ne- yeah. you know, try not to have him slouch or hunch or curve, sure. he automatically, gets this like kind of calm regalness which is part of his character and if i draw yeah, sure. sax more slouchy more like if i if i make those shoulders look like he's frustrated look like he's angry yeah that's great if i always have his cloak moving it fits who Car- saxon is as a character and those were the like the, some of those were shortcuts that i was finding as i was going on that that's were great. intentional some of them yeah. were just oh that looks cooler yeah. And then some of them were, hey, I'd never drawn a mouse from this angle until this panel called for it. And now that I have, I'm kind of figuring out some of the anatomy again. Sure. It's going to also affect when I draw them from a profile or from the top down or whatever. Did you did you find yourself sort of like, did you discover that because you had sort of... I don't know what the best, how to, how to best describe. Like there, there are things that we port over from the influences that we don't even actively search out from. So in the case of drawing mouse cartoon, like mouse caricatures, right? There are going to be things. If you were to ask me to draw them, I naturally would take from everything from Disney to everything that I've seen that people have, you know, the other way people will have drawn anthropomorphized animals, right? Mm-hmm. Now, did you find yourself did you find yourself with a realization of like because I've limited myself to like little dots on the eyes, I, I you know I kind of painted myself in a corner in as far as like having them emote or having them giving them the giving them personalities. You actually had to rediscover other ways to 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 build in character outside of just like the the typical faces, you know. The design stemmed from partly because of the era that we were in. Um, Give us context on that, Dave. Pre, Pre-Google image search. Okay. Um, so if I wanted to look at what mice look like from different angles, I was either going to have to invest in some taxidermy or, um, which also wasn't like, I don't know that the internet was brimming with easy to buy mouse taxidermy at that minute. Sure. Um, or you'd get like a book, uh, 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 one of those big photo coffee table books on animals or on, you know, on rodents. Yeah. And if you're lucky, 
like there's going to be 10 pictures in that book that are specific to what you need and they're not going to be the angles that you necessarily want mm, mm, true uh -huh. I just had to come up with a way to draw a mouse that looked enough like a mouse that someone without you know, without a title that says mouse guard right right get that's a mouse not a rat <laughs> sure and that I'm not doing a cartoon where the character can squash and stretch their way. You didn't want out. that, is what you're saying. I, I didn't want that. There, there's mm. a, there's a like, um, kind of harsh realism that the mice are all they have in the world. Is you know are each other and this and mm -hmm. this group called the mouse part. And so there can't be any like, do sex machina kind of way to save them. Whether that's religion or uh, you know a mallet that uh, you know they can pull out from behind their their back and mm -hmm. or a bear trap you know, like cartoon style or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, had, it had to be like, oh, they are foraging for food because that's the only way they're going to make it to the next town. Oh, that sword, if it breaks, that's the only sword he has. Right. So it had to have this like kind of real feeling in the same way that like Beatrix Potter's animals feel like real animals, even for though sure. they're wearing. Um, so I needed a design that I could draw over and over I didn't have a lot of reference handy um, to rely on, and, uh, and and they needed to they needed to look realistic enough that you knew what it was and, and would get that point across. So t you actively and purposefully took away all that squash and stretch. You said I'm I'm going to I'm going to turn I'm going to do enough cartooning, but never cross a particular squash and stretch threshold, right? I mean, That's I was looking at Aesop's Fables was uh, was an, uh, an inspiration point, and so I just looked a lot of like Golden Age illustrators, and actually, the, I, I've, I've shared this lots of the times. In fact, there's a there's a um, video on my YouTube channel called Drawing Like Yourself. That's a lecture that I did that goes into some of this stuff about kind of the early designs of the, the mice from Mouse Guard. Yeah. Um, and there's an, uh, a specific illustration by an illustrator named Tom Port. Who's also a Michigander, and I had the uh, I, I had the fortune of being able to interview him at, when I was in college. Although that was also that was after I had seen this illustration and kind of cribbed him. Mm -hmm. But he had done a he did a book called Coyote Goes Walking that was a retelling of after of uh, uh, Native American uh, trickster stories with the Coyote as a main character. Um, yeah, and there was one where Coyote kind of is trying to torment some some mice, and. And I had this book. I loved his illustrations. They felt like golden age illustrations for me, even though he was he was contemporary. And uh, and yeah, there was this one like two page spread of of all these mice hiding inside of a, of a um, buffalo skull, the hollow of a buffalo skull, while the sure. coyote is peeking. And they're all wearing like Native American animal skin kind of traditional dress. Tom Tom Port researches that stuff um, a lot. And so I started the first drawing of mouse guard mice were me copying the way he drew mice. Mm, and then because you couldn't see their bodies and I didn't know how to draw the anatomy of like, how would you draw a mouse standing on its hind legs? I just kind of copied the shape of those, those native American animal skin robes, mm -hmm. except I turned them into cloaks, right. which is why the guard are cloaks. So right on. Yeah, but I was looking at classic kind of uh, uh, like Golden Age illustration style, uh, children's illustrations, um, more like in an Aesop's Fables kind of a world rather than looking at like Five Ol or Mickey Mouse or Disney's Robin Hood or those kind of things. Sure. Let's, uh, there's a couple that questions in the chat. Let me get to them. Um, first, let me say hello to uh, hello Indie Comics Podcast. Hello from the Philippines. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining uh my friend Michael DeNicola and our special guest, uh, David Peterson. Um, let's see. Mark K says, the happy mistakes are actually evolutions. I agree with that to an extent. Sometimes they're just mistakes. <laughs> um, uh, Sometimes. You, scare, uh, you Scared Jordy says, a great example of visible skill improving of the illustrator's books progress in the Vampire Hunter D manga right on. Right on. Uh, Mark has a question. How do you curb style fixation of other artists' styles and want to incorporate those into your own art? Dave? 
Yeah, I, so I actually, I've done an, uh, a lecture um, that I mentioned already called Drawing Like Yourself mm -hmm. on my YouTube channel. And in there, I talk about um, that there's this like, because th there is definitely a time and a place to emulate your heroes mm -hmm. um, and to copy the works of others. Uh, mm -hmm. even directly like that's an old master's way of sure. of learning composition and learning technique sure but there comes a point when you have to you know it's like when i was a boy i was or when i was a child i played with childish things when i became a man or an adult you know i put away i put those childish things away like mm -hmm. there's a point as a as an artist that you need to at some point put those influences away or at least treat them differently um so I'm, I'm a huge Mignola fan, and there mm. were many years where I tried to be Mignola. I tried sure. to be Mike. Sure. And I wasn't great at it, and I kind of realized, like, at best, I'm always going to be a second-rate Mignola. Sure. Even even if I like, get this down, I'm yeah. still going to be a second -rate. Right. So um, as, as, as I went on with, you know, just my own kind of stuff... Um, but still, like even sometimes when I was working on Mouse Guard, I remember a panel from Hellboy and be like, I want, I want something like what Mike did in that part of the story, but obviously I can't draw it like Mike because that's mm. not going to look right or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, and it's it's about breaking down your 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 hero's work um, past the facade. So a lot of people when they try to emulate. For example, again, Mignola, they see these like kind of chonky shapes and big blocky shadows and skinny wrists. And they're like, that's it. I've cracked the Mignola code. And it's like, no, right. that's the sighting on the house. Mm -hmm. Like there's a framework. There's an interior to that house. There is so much depth there mm. that you need to break down. So it's more like you need to start asking yourself the questions like, what is it about that panel or that image or whatever that's resonating with me and go deeper than just like, well, I love the big blocky shadows. Is it about, I love how the character is popping off of the background. I love the way that, that there's mm. there's a sense of depth. Is it that I love that my eye is drawn a certain way? It, uh, you know, my eye as the viewer is drawn through the image in a certain way. Um, you know, there, there's lots of questions you can ask yourself like that. And then you have to start breaking it down to how is he achieving that? Yeah. Is it about, the balance of the size of the character versus the size of the overall piece. Where in the piece is that central figure? Does color play a role? Do you know negative spaces play a role? You know how could you do the same kind of thing but still use detail as opposed you know like a lot of line detail as opposed to what mm. Mike's doing and still achieve that? Those are the kinds of things you have to you have to break through the facade of. The person, the style, you know, the style facade of the person that's your hero, mm. and uh, and then just try to try to break it down into into smaller bits, and and even just asking yourself, what is it about this piece that's appealing to me, and how could I do that the way I draw naturally? That's great. That's great. I always say, in part, purely from a technical um, exercise, and it's I think whenever I see a person adopt a style from an obvious sort of resource, from an obvious source, from, a, from an artist, right? I think they mm -hmm. land it well, but it is, and this isn't the right word, but I think you'll get the, my, my drift, which is it comes off a bit lifeless and it comes mm -hmm. off as a derivative, right? And I think it's because what they yeah. land um, is, I've seen a lot of guys who are really in love with the way Dave Finch renders things, right? And I look at and I and they land the rendering perfectly, right? But what they've accomplished is the technical skill of being able to render like Dave Finch does. What they haven't sort of uncovered is the why he renders the things that he does, right? Like or the the mm -hmm. reasoning why you know he does what I what I refer to as like Morse code rendering, you know, which is like dash dot, right? Yep, yep. I lovingly say that, you know, I respectfully say, it. but like. People understand how to. I mean, there's there's even a a a, a, um, a Procreate brush that does it natively now, Dave. I don't know if you've yep. ever seen it. I have yep. it in my I have it in my brush set, and it makes me laugh every time I see it. Because again, from a purely technical exercise, 
it, it lands it better than anything that I could do on my own trying to learn how to use a, um, you know, a nib and some ink, right? But I think where people's um, approach falls apart is because they don't have the reasoning and the, and the, 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 the foundational understanding of it, you know? And I think that speaks in part to what you're talking about. Yeah, I totally agree. There are people who will come and talk to me at conventions because they have a portfolio that has um, cross hatching, and they think yes. like, "Oh, I'm or in texture and stuff." And they're like, "Oh, I want to talk to you about this." Mm -hmm. And I would say sixty percent, maybe even seventy percent of the people, my first, like my first big note is stop scribbling. You think that you're making cross hatching lines, and you're not. Like you need to be making these lines with purpose. Mm. And you're just kind of like, you're so invested in filling up that space with lines that mm -hmm. you're, you're scribbling. You're not even picking your pen back up off the paper. I can see the loop. <laughs> right, right, and right, it's, right. It's a casual thing that's not, it's not like you are missing the intention behind these lines. Because right. for me, if and you're trying to do it like me, the space between the lines is as important as the line. Like you're, right. you're kind of making your own, you know, very organic color or a, a halftone screen, you know, sure. halftone pattern. And so the density of, or the, the shape of the positive mark, the, the black mark, mm -hmm. um, how, how big that is, does it have a specific shape? Does it, you know, does it have a direction? Does it have a flow, whatever? Um, those things are important, the, the mark that you make, but the space that you leave between every mark informs how gray that is, how busy that is, how overwhelming it is, how, sure. and you have to have really good control so that you can do gradients, so that you can kind of spot it all over your piece the same way that you would spot large black areas so that you're not overwhelming your reader's eye. And yeah, without having an understanding of that, you're doing like, you're going through those motions, just like you said, like you're, you're it's, it's a soulless, exercise of like let me just fill this space because that's what the other guy i think does right the render looks great but the purpose is off and i think that's why that's where it fails for me i'm like man that's a really great well, you have really amazing control over that brush whether it be digital or traditional but unfortunately you're not quite understanding why that thing is being rendered that way it's not just for the sake of rendering thanks for asking mark i really appreciate it okay so if I wanted to ask you about what you your writing style is when it comes to to mouse guard. First of all, did did you already have you, you were talking about how you had, um, you know, you were developing her heroes and characters already independent of mouse guard, and it just happens to be that mouse guard is the one that you landed on because it was the one that was exclusively yours, and you felt like it had legs, right? Had you yeah. already established sort of a a narrative technique, a writing style, or for the lack no. of a better term? No, no, I okay. knew, and, and actually the story that was there, so that I came up with those characters in about 1996. Okay. And then it, at that convention, that fall convention in 2000, late 2004, where I told people like, oh yeah, I'll have the next issue by, by the next convention. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of time in between there. And during that time, other than just kind of noodling about with like, oh, this character eventually, you know, is it kind of becomes an adoptive father of this character or mm -hmm, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, this character is going to eventually have a parting of ways with that character. Other than those kinds of broad notes, I didn't have a story other than knowing there's a huge war that happens during the winter with the measles. Mm. Okay, okay. That was it. So when in 19 in, in 2004, when I'm promising, hey, I'm going to have this next issue and I have to now sit down or you know, I, I'm going to have an issue out and yeah. I have to sit down and start writing this thing or start drawing this thing, start making a comic, I go, am I capable? Like I'm, I'm trying to draw a comic for the first sure. time. Am I capable of drawing a story that is a giant war with the weasels as yeah. my issue? War? I don't think so. I think that's bigger than me. Okay. And I also think, in some ways, bigger than my audience. Like, that's fascinating. You can't, you can't drop people right into, you know, this enormous conflict. Right. Um, and there's so much to be explained. You know. Right. Like, what what yeah, place? How do they live? What's their society like? What's the? You know, I don't understand the premise yet. If it's if it's more like real life, I think you can get away with some of that. But when it's when there's so much fantasy world stuff that the 
audience doesn't quite know yet. You have yeah. to you have to ease them in. So I just yeah. came up with a new one issue story that was specifically designed for how do I explain what the mouse guard is? Mm, okay. All right. That was issue one. It was like I want to. I'm going to have them out just kind of doing this like routine mission, uh, looking for a missing grain merchant, and then they find him. And there was a fight, and then they find him, and he's already dead, and they, you know, battle a snake, and and I was gonna wrap the issue up a couple of pages short, just because that's where it landed. And at the like eleventh hour, I went, I think I need to add a couple pages here that opens the door a little bit more for an issue two. Mm. They found a map on the missing merchant that was kind of like proof. That he was a traitor. He was he was giving out information that he shouldn't. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out, like how how did he even get this map and who was he taking it to and and now the, the those three mice are like and we're gonna find out and they just march off into the distance and then that's the, the end of the issue and I thought like if that's the end if nobody wants issue two if I try to sell a hundred copies of this and only sell two and one's to my grandma hmm. uh, then that's okay that's the end. They wander mm. off with the mission. Yeah, yeah. But people like this, I've got an issue too. And then once Archaeus, I, I had started working on some stuff for issue two, like I said, with the idea of self-publishing it, but then hooked up with Archaea and they said, let's go um, and let's do it in color. So I had to color issue one. Um, <laughs> right. Then I kind of, had, I had to quickly build out the remaining six issues. During that initial San Diego meeting with Mark, he had all kinds of questions for me, creative questions that I I didn't really have answers for. Yeah, no, those are great. Yeah, those and are one great. of them was like, what, uh, how, how long, how long is this series? Like, what's, uh, what would be the first arc? And I did like a really quick mental arithmetic where it was like, four would be nice. Four might be not enough space to do what I need, though maybe six and i just blurted out oh it's a six issue arc <laughs> no clue what happened yeah, in those six what that those right issues. i just went yeah six issues and i kind of knew like oh we're we're gonna you know we're we're building to that there's a traitor within the mice and that it's, it's showing what the mouse guard is the easiest way to do that is have the villain be everything that the mouse guard isn't as a mm -hmm. as a like morality a stake in morality Mm -hmm. So, um, but I didn't know like, oh yeah, here are the beats. Issue three is going to be this. Issue four is going to be that. Issue nope. I'm just like, there's a villain, and they're going to have to fight him, and this is what he stands for. <laughs> right. But I didn't say that. I just said, yeah, it's a six issue arc. Has all kinds of twists and turns. We go to the mouse guard, the home of the mouse guard, to Lock Haven. And there's lots of stuff that happens. And he was like, cool, great. The interesting challenge for me writing, and, and I think this reflects on what you're talking about a bit, in that when I'm writing, when I'm writing a story, I, I, I approach it similar to you where there is what you described to me more to be like, the, here's the plot, right? Yeah. But where I get really caught up, when I, when I really, really love writing is when I'm understanding or building character, right? as they drive that plot. Does that, does that make sense? Because oftentimes I, I find that people come up with a plot and come up with an, um, come up with an exposition and anybody inside that story or anybody inside that plot can say the same exact thing as somebody else. And it doesn't necessarily drive the, 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 the character's motivation doesn't necessarily drive the, the story forward. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't motivate the plot at all. They're just like, they're, they're there as exposition delivery devices, you know? So to it's come a, up with it, it's a ride at Disneyland where you're just the you know the characters are just on this track, correct, and they're gonna move by some waving bears, and at some point <laughs> the ride, is, uh, yeah, there's yeah. no choice. And, and in, in a way, it, there has to be a form of that, right? Because obviously, there there you need to lead it into a story. But there's a way in there is a way in which you conduct those characters so that it comes off very natural. And I was struggling with that for the longest time. So I was going to ask you about that to be like, what you just explained to me is, is generally you came up with a plot. You came up with an idea of maybe where it can go within six issues. How did you mm -hmm. go about understanding the actual story, you know? 
Well, so I mean, every every one of the the three major mouse guard books, I wrote a little differently. So I was mm, describing okay. that, and that first one was very much what you're describing. Of like, I have a plot, and there are a couple you know character specific things that like this is this character is the wise character, this character is the angry character. So I can't really swap their dialogue. Sure. But in terms of them like making meaningful decisions, no, mm -hmm. it's the plot moving forward. Right. Uh, but I, I did break that down. I broke it down just as a issue by issue beat thing where I'm like, okay, so um, if issue, you know, if issue one is all out in the woods and we just saw the snake and all that kind of stuff, issue two, and, and, and it's, it seems like they've implied with this map something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh, issue two, I got a little nervous where I was like, uh oh, uh, I, I don't have a creature attack, but I think that's, I think the battle with the snake is what everybody liked, so I have to do that again. So I kind mm. of redid issue one as issue two again. Um, but this time was like, yes, there is definitely something rotten in the state of Denmark. And then issue three was now the characters have to actually get to where the source of something's rotten. Um, and the reader has to see what's at stake. There, here's a mouse city. We're going to see one of the very you know many mouse cities. Now we understand what a mouse city is and why if they fall, it's no good. Sure. Then issue four, we're in the <clears throat> mentor. Issue five was the villain issue, and issue six was the, the wrap-up at Lock Haven, at the home of the guard. And then I just kind of broke them down as I worked on them. As I've gone on, there have definitely been more character driven pushes emotional mm. pushes mm. Um, i uh like the whole second series uh when the winter book and I, this might be a spoiler for some people but you know the book's been out for a while so get over it um <laughs> it's 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 a mentor mentee relationship you know if, if you've studied any of uh like hero of a thousand faces and the mono myth and stuff like that it's it's pretty traditional that a character's mentor leaves before that mentee is ready. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Obi Wan leaves Luke before he even has to blow up the Death Star. Luke Luke was not trained yet sure. when, when his mentor goes away. Harry loses Dumbledore when he's only you know destroyed one Horcrux. It's you know it, it's like this devastating moment where they think they still can't even go on without their mentor. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what that all was. It was about this character, Liam, getting to finally connect with this character, Kalanaw, and then that character dying on him. Mm. Um, and and what, the, what that actually means um, long-term. So um, that was more of an emotional thing. Uh, yeah. Where I, I was pushing character and, and how that was going to motivate characters. And, um, the emotional impact that would have on characters. Yeah, yeah. That's that stuff has become so um, um, critically important to me, um, especially when I'm writing my own stuff, because I feel like the there there it has to be a level of under like people always say, "Oh, make your characters relatable," which I don't necessarily 100% agree with. I, I I totally I get where it's coming from, right? Like if somebody has to have that that ultimate thing of hurt so that people can understand, oh, okay, that's what's that's what's motivating, that's what's driving your character. I, I defer more to the side of you you need to be able to at least understand the characters, not necessarily relate to them. You know? So yeah whenever when I, think I'm, it's, I think it's dangerous not to, to have a main character that you can't relate to. Not impossible. Mm, mm. Dangerous. But outside of like a main character, a central character, yeah, your characters don't have to be relatable. They just why? Be why do you? Why do you say that? Dave? Why is it that? Why is it that relatability is important for your, for your protagonist, your main protagonist? Uh, I mean, for, just for the common sense reasons. Like you want, there are there are TV shows that that my wife will sometimes put on, where, I'm like, why are we watching this? I <laughs> okay. hate everyone on this show there mm. is nobody here who i find redeemable mm. but is Why that relatability I... or is that like are you talking about somebody that's redeeming you know like is is that one and the same are those like sort of handcuffed to each other uh, okay. yeah i mean i guess i guess in some ways those are different but I, I mean i guess relatable means that they have to be redeemable in the sense that you're you're 
they are relatable in that your audience sees something that they relate to in the character, even if it's mm. a flaw. Mm. Like it's a flaw that's overcomable. It's it's not a like, oh yeah, I uh, you know I kidnapped children and I <laughs> sure. burned down churches. And, right, uh, right. Blah, blah blah. But hey, I'm my soul might be redeemable. Right. And maybe right. there's an argument if that soul is redeemable, but I doubt there are very many readers who are gonna feel re a relation to that main character. Mm, mm. Now having that character somewhere else not as the protagonist uh i think it's fine yeah i think in the in, in the done horrible things and is still somehow looking for redemption that's interesting right i was just about to say that it's like you you have to want your audience to somehow cheer for this person even though the thing that they've done isn't necessarily like you know isn't likable you know, like that's that's the other thing that I've heard people say. Oh, you have to make your main character likable, and I'm like, that's so that concept is so broad to me, right? Because I'm trying to think of a character that I'm like, I don't care for Hannibal Lecter. You know, I don't care for. And as a matter of fact, when I'm when I'm watching Silence of the Lambs and I'm and I'm watching um, uh, Jodie Foster play Clarice, I don't I don't look at her and I go like. Oh man, I really, I, I really understand. I really relate to that character, but I do want her to overcome. You know, I feel like there's lots of relatability with with Clarice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and broad. I mean, it's not like I grew up <laughs> having to go to a farm. My dad wasn't a cop who died, and I went to a farm and heard lamb screaming or anything like that. Sure, sure, sure. I didn't, I didn't train at Quantico, but. There's the thing of like, especially when that movie, when that book was written and then when the movie was made, the idea of a woman FBI agent, like they, mm -hmm. and they play that up a couple times in the, in the movie where they did. Yep. You know, the, the, the room of, she's like, okay, move along. And the room of men just stare at her. Like, who do you think you're pushing yeah. into this room? Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Which but see, that's what I'm talking, but that's what and, I'm talking about. Like, 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 that's not relatable to me because I'm on the other side of that rope. It's right? relatable to everyone. It's relatable to everyone because you have, you have felt that small and insignificant in some aspect of your life. Mm. I don't know everyone if I has. agree. I relate to it only because I want that person to be proven worthy of that space. Not because I've been I mean, put in... Whether it's on a... Whether it's on a, on a playground or in a classroom or with peers either mm. um a, 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 a discrepancy of what the what the ethnicity and skin color is of the people who are in the room and you're the other thing mm -hmm. or whether it's a gender thing or mm -hmm. a size mm -hmm. thing i find it hard to believe that that you know there's someone out there who hasn't felt other or less than not because they are less than, but because the room made the them room feels feel. it, right. That's worth that's worth thinking about. I've never thought of her as somebody that I can relate to, but I understand the position that she's in, okay. you okay. know, and therefore I cheer for her, right? Like I go, like I want her to be proven correct. I want her to succeed. Um, maybe I'm being too literal about the concept of relatability, you know. Like I have a, I have a, whatever. I have a broken foot, and that character has a broken foot. Whatever. That's that's overly simplistic. But you know what I'm coming. We know where I'm coming from. Um. Anyway, so so you you were developing. Wait, let me check in with chat to see if there's anything I've missed. Wait, I thought we were uh, supposed to root for Hannibal Lecter. No. <laughs> that's that's you, Michael. Oh, okay. That's you. You saw the guy behind the glass and the perverted way that he talks to people, and you're like, that's that's my hero. That's my I really do that guy. But they did an interesting thing, though, because his success is tied to her success. So at the same time, you do want him to succeed. Sure. Only, f yeah, yeah uh, for as a proxy for her, right? Well, as a proxy for her and for the senator's daughter mm. who's in the pit. Hello, Kakua. How are you? Mark K says, what about antiheroes? Billy Bob in Bad Santa. And I think he's referring to uh, Clarice saying she has an underdog aspects that make you root for her. Yeah, that. That I can relate to. That I mean, uh, that I can cheer for. That I can understand. You know, um, let's see here. I don't really relate to her. I just want her to succeed. That's that's more of my position, which is, you know, I understand her position, and therefore I want for I want for her to win. 
Uh, Lex Everett says, uh, yeah, I've been kind of asking, does my protagonist really need an arc considering their circumstances? I understand the rules and conventions, but are, are they hard and fast? Um, there's, I don't know if, if, I can't say that it's a hard and fast rule, but it's the easy one. It is the easiest one. Yeah. Your, your character doesn't necessarily have to change, but if they don't, you you take on a, a gargantuan task. We talked about this before, before, Eric and I. There are some archetypes, Marty McFly and Back to the Future, the first. Sure. Uh, the character generally doesn't change. The Marty mm -hmm. McFly that you get in the beginning is the same, essentially, the Marty McFly you get in the end, mm -hmm. not yeah. considering the other two movies. He doesn't do much. It's the world around him that changes. Mm -hmm. He saves Doc Brown. He saves his parents. He encourages them. He changes his whole future, but the world changes because of marty not the other way around it's yeah. it'd be like you're you're writing the story instead of from luke's standpoint from the the standpoint of the mentor so you were yeah. you're from the yoda standpoint and in that, in that, in that specific case change is a very broad concept right like marty's change comes from a better understanding of his situation through the eyes of his as he experiences it through the eyes of his parents but yeah. he himself has not he himself has not fundamentally changed you know what i mean he just has a a better appreciation of his position a better appreciation of who they turned into but that doesn't necessarily suddenly he doesn't get inspired to be the next big scientist you know but to yeah. your point he, he you know the classic hero's journey right he doesn't like he doesn't falter and break and have to confront his uh demons right. you know there, right. there's none of that there right right there is no third you know there is no bottom of the second act you know as far as the, the structure is concerned where he finally feels like it's, it's more of a of the bottom yeah. the plot goes through that bottom of the second act but he himself does yes. not you know no yeah. And Indiana Jones is a little bit like that too, but I, I still think that there's, you know, when, when we talk about arc, unfortunately screenwriting has turned it into this like very broad, predictable arc mm -hmm. where the character, maybe even it has to be an origin story where they start at nothing and overcome mm -hmm. great things, mm -hmm. falter, come back, or even if they start on like a, a medium footing of, you know, they're, they're they're well equipped to do whatever the task is. They still have that, like you said, that that moment of crisis. That am I going to turn to the dark side, or am I going to give up, or mm. whatever. Mm. Indiana Jones, the only one that's really like that in the first one is is the death of Marion, and it's not so much that like it changes him. He's still just kind of moving forward, but there is some change. It's just small. It's human. Mm. Mm. It's human level change. It's not this big broad life-changing event i mean it's life-changing because you know marion dies but it's not it changes his entire trajectory and i think the same kind of thing could be said about marty and it's about his appreciation for his parents or human beings correct you know his mm. parents like these unrelatable aliens at the beginning and all the shit that they're saying with like oh i never called a boy i never did that you know mm -hmm. kind of implying mm -hmm. like her daughter's slut because mm -hmm. she's getting a phone call from a boy or marty's getting a phone call from a girl mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but uh, and then but oh, go ahead, after, sorry. I was like, oh, there's hypocrisy, and there's this natural cycle of you know, parents kind of not doing what they said they did when they were in you know, like oh, I don't want to air all my dirty laundry to my kids, right? So I right. act like I was earlier than now. Yeah. To um, and, and to appreciation there with Marty that I think is a, it's it's an arc. It's just a really small, subtle, but yeah. subtle. Yeah, but see, that's what we're talking about. Like, but, you know, that's what Lex was asking about, which is like, is it a hard and fast rule? The answer is no, absolutely not. I mean, there's it's been it's been shown that it that it works, but it does need to exist in some capacity, right? Like, however subtle it may be, it still needs to exist, especially when it comes to a screenplay. Now, when it comes to let's say a, a novel, maybe not so much, right? It's not a because there's so many other components when it comes to telling a narrative through a book as opposed to 120 pages worth of a movie that will feel natural and and it doesn't even necessarily mean that your character is, needs to win, right? But it does mean that you have a clear understanding of everybody's goals and how those goals are, are, are uh, moved forward by those characters, it's, or how, those, how the character is motivated in order to accomplish those goals, right? And somewhere in there is an arc, whether it be a, an environmental one, the environment in which the character exists in, or a personal one, character growth one. The character growth one is the easy one. That one is like, that's so formulaic, you can see it in any movie. You can literally clock it 
like right here at the 10 minute mark is when the end of the explanation of the world happens. And at the 12 minute mark, this is when the goal gets set up, you know? Anyway, good luck. I, mean, I, I struggled with it for a long, long time. You can have a character that um, even starts out with the exact same belief system, view of the world, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, as they do at the very end, mm -hmm. but then in the you know somewhere in the middle, have enough other people around them convince them that maybe that's not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fun. So that they, it like they come right back around. You know, character development wise, they didn't really go anywhere. They they're exactly where they were at the start in terms of their their beliefs or worldview or whatever. Mm. But they still had to grow to get past that moment of doubt. That's you know what? That would be good to see in a Captain America movie, because Captain America is another one who doesn't generally change his intrinsic person who he is. He's generally maintains the same. But it'd be nice to see him have doubt question if he is yeah. doing the right thing yeah yeah hello eric housel how are you good evening thank you for being here am i what do you call it in my stream my is my stream still going on like it lagged just for a split second using this program that i have i think it's for still me going. yeah for me you are chat's still right. up i still see you right on okay still hello to everybody okay what was it what were we talking about before I asked, uh, or I answered, we answered Lex's, does my protagonist really need an arc considering their circumstances? I think that's a fascinating concept that when people don't land it, well, and by the way, as formulaic as that is, um, pe some people don't even know how to, ha how to handle that formula well because they miss the part in which you have to have, and I think this goes back to what we were talking about previous, which is you have to have an understanding of the character. And when... The ki uh, and I'm, I'm going to pick on Miss Marvel in a big bad way, but oh, when yeah. when you don't have an understanding of what that character needs to be, when you don't have an understanding of what that goal of the character needs to be, it's hard. It's very difficult to arc them, whether it be in an environment. I think that's what Miss Marvel was trying to do, or um, Captain Marvel was trying to do, was the Marty McFly arc, right? But it doesn't. Yeah. It's it's clumsy because it doesn't understand what the character's goals are. It switches, yeah, and not in the, and not even in a fundamental, not even in a thematic way, where it's still aligned, but it's now it's a, like so. The difference is you're not really. Let me give you an example. This entire time, I've always I thought that I wanted to have an understanding of who my father was, but in in real or who I was, but in reality, or who my father was, but in reality, I'm looking for that because it it helps me understand who I who I've turned myself into or or who I've become, right? So that's right. sort of like a shift in in the sh that's a shift in um, in want, right? That's a shift in like the character's yes. motivation, but ultimately it sh it's it's still in theme of trying to understand something, right? Captain Marvel doesn't have that. It doesn't quite understand what they want that character to, to the goals of that character and what they want her to have. Yeah, no, there, there really is. Yeah, if you're, you're right. If you're not going to do the classic hero's arc, the hero's journey, where their, where their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, their, their needs come head to head with their flaws, and they have to find some way to overcome and surmount. Uh, if you don't do that then yeah no there has to be more happening around that character uh that helps propel them in the story forward otherwise well what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing yeah, yeah well think I about mean, what dave think about what dave just said earlier right like it was the perfect example which is they start off believing one thing right they get opposition in in um that belief right however many characters in whatever capacity it's not even have to be characters it could be the environment but by the end they are that much more convinced that the thing that they believed in in the beginning um was actually true that much more reinforced because they had to go through those trials right i think that's fair right if you're going to start off a character already at the prime of her abilities 
you have to throw the environment at her or like the situation at her so that by the end she believes in it that much more. And that's what that's what Captain Marvel struggled with. It didn't quite understand if it was that story, the example that David was talking about, or the ones that we're talking about, which is a traditional hero's journey, you know? I cut you off, Dave. What were you saying? I was just going to say, it, it, uh, like, I don't know entirely who our audience is here in the in the chat, but mm. also, like, don't don't be intimidated by, by what we're saying with all these really complex things about story and motivation and etc. Sometimes it's okay to just tell a story that's an adventure. Mm. And if it doesn't have the arc that it needs, well, you've got one story under your belt. You can look at the things in that that For worked, sure. the things that didn't, and then improve on it. For sure. Don't don't yeah. hear all this stuff and think that now you have to sit down and have your your debut story, you know, hit on every on every note on every level, and 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 be ticking all of these boxes of you know the the flaws we're talking about. Yeah, uh, admittedly, admittedly, this comes from a very nerdy place, you know, like it, it, it's, it's totally okay to like essentially do a do a um a story that's like a a. a a bland D and D adventure. Like sure. it, it's okay to tell that story. Yeah, it's you know, not okay to tell five of those in a row. Right, that's well, where you grow as a story. Right, tell. you know, Dude, you know, that's uh, funny that you mentioned that. Go, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Just, just to today's point, he pointed out. Uh, he mentioned video games. I thought of fetch quests, like we are favorite RPGs, and then I thought of, of course, the Mandalorian season two. Like mm. a handful of of those episodes there wasn't too much obviously there's an overarching character arc for uh the mandalorian but those are a bunch of random fetch quests he went on and they were for a sure. fucking blast so for sure. on air yeah no my, my point was like there are a couple of books that i get really super harsh on because you know it's the day when it comes to crowdfunding right like there's there's a couple that i have contributed to in which i read and i go Okay, I'm critical about this because it doesn't follow this sort of nerdy stuff that we were talking about previous, which is like character arcs and motivation and blah, 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 and all this structure. But then a part of me also has to step back and say, is the victory that this book exists? Is that the, is that the, success, is, is that the success metric, right? Which is to your point, Dave, right? Which is like, it's, it, it, was it, you know, is the takeaway, dude, this, you know, at least now this is out. You know, and you can only build up from here, right? Or was there something that could have been done ahead of time so that that story could have been a little bit more shored up in the at the very beginning? You know, sure. I mean, I think some of that also begs the question of, you know, is and I don't, I actually don't want to know what projects you're talking about, but like, yep. is that a project from someone who is a first time creator, or mm. even maybe someone who has done, um. They've done work for Marvel or DC, but this is the first time that they're writing and drawing something mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. something like, that. like is, in in that case, yeah, the fact that the thing exists is the victory. Yeah, nitpicking yeah, yes. could be better is is a worthy thing to go into when that person is looking at what their next project is. For sure, if someone who is experienced goes i'm gonna try i'm gonna purposely not do something you know traditional i'm gonna try something else i'm gonna try mm -hmm. like i'm gonna even experiment with with narrative style and mm -hmm. do something just really different mm -hmm. and then they fall flat on their face and and the takeaway is like oh if you'd followed these these joseph campbell's story points this thing would have worked Mm -hmm. that's not really a fair metric to apply either because their goal was something different. Was and we know from yeah. other examples of their work, they do know better. Right. They were purposely experimenting. Right. right. So I think it also depends on the context of w who made this and when in their career and what were they trying. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, let me read. The concept reminds me of Herman Essay's Sid Har Hartha. He starts perfect and ends the same, yet it's the nature of his conflict that is the basis for his growth, for sure. Hello, good evening, Black Rose Comics. Hello, I Borrow Ideas, good evening. Amanda B, good evening, thank you for being here. Uh, American Discord, thank you so much for being here and joining us. Um, I caught up to everyone. Welcome. Hello, welcome, thank you for joining us. I'm here with my good friend, uh, Michael DiNicola who's co-streaming with me, but also author, illustrator. 
of uh, the amazing story, Mouse Guard, Mr. David Peterson. Thank you for joining us. David Peterson. Of course. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your insight, Dave Peterson. David Peterson. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think I'm trying you know, to have uh, I Monstrositus says uh, I Monstrositus X says I'm trying to have action along with story arc and strong character building. So the so basically the perfect <laughs> you're basically coming up with like with a perfect formula. That's amazing. That's that's I I believe that's a worthwhile effort. Allow for to to Dave's point. Allow for maybe that you know if you don't necessarily ch check all of those boxes that use it as a learning opportunity and then from there catapult yourself into the next box that you need to check yeah I'm a like big... go ahead go ahead michael no i was going to say i really appreciate that because you know it's it's sometimes like you took a step back and you're like hey all in perspective if this is your first story it's more important that you get it done and have it finished than be so so critical and feel so you know, feel that pressure. I'm a big fan of attainable goals mm. and setting yourself attainable goals. Um, I mean, there are definitely times where you should set really hard goals to push yourself. But I think when it comes to comic storytelling, attainable goals, um, where, you, yeah, you're going to have to reach, you're going to have to do something that's a little out of your comfort zone, but it's not impossible because otherwise mm. you're setting yourself up for failure. And so, like, in that second book, what I said, you know, part of the emotion was about this character dying, this mentor character dying, and the torch being passed and everything else. The the kind of, like, B-plot going on was, I was like, can I handle romance? Can I can mm. I do a love story, a budding mm. love story? And so there's, like, a budding love story that's taking place in a really kind of horrific location. It's, like, it, it, it's essentially like the, the weasel tunnels that are, like, a, be like going through Mount Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh yeah, what if I don't did a, a, a love story there? Right. Um, Mauschwitz was not the word I think I'd hear today. Mauschwitz. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that was a challenge. And I I can now years later look at it and go, there are parts of the like, can I tell a love story? Yes, there are parts mm -hmm. of that that are success. Mm -hmm. I tried something I'd never tried before. The emotion comes across, it works, people picked up on it. I think I did some cool stuff without even necessarily having characters use the word love and yeah. we understood the emotions they were going through. Yeah. But I can also look at it with critical eyes and go, I could have done so much better of a job. I missed this beat and I missed that beat and I maybe was too heavy handed or ham fisted with this part or I didn't get the point across as much over here. I didn't go far enough, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. And just having the attainable goal of going, hey, I, I did it. I tried telling a little love story. I did it. And now if I want to do another one, uh, I just need to do it a little different and and take what I learned from that and, and build on it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get um, pretty decent, and decent is subjective, Dave, so, so take it with a grain of salt. Do you get pretty decent feedback, uh, critical feedback for the for the stuff that you get published? Who are you getting it from? Right? Is, is it an audience? And who do you, which are the ones that you internalize for yourself where you say, I, that's, that makes a whole lot of sense to me? Or, are there, and you know, you, the reason why I ask is because everybody has the opportunity and obviously the liberty to be able to come to you and say, hey, I bought your book and, you know, I didn't particularly care the way you told that love story in Mousewitz, yeah. right? But there are going to be some where you're, you, there, there's ha there has to be a mechanism that you employ because you're like, I, you could get, you could drown in that much feedback, you know? Is there, is there a certain group of people where you go or have, that you have as an extension to say, read this script, and this might not be exactly it, so forgive me if this is clumsy, but read the script, tell me what you think, or after it's been published, they give you their feedback and you go, yep, absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Do you have that in place? Yeah, so I have, I have like, you know, Stephen King talks about your first reader, mm. you know, and for his wife, Tabitha, um, who gets to hear all the ideas she gets to hear the first draft. She gets to hear the middle draft. She gets to hear the the, the final one before it goes to press. You know, and and he can he can get from her what he needs. Hmm. Um, and I think there are other people in his life that do that too. So for me, that's that's both Julia and a couple friends. Jeremy uh, Bastion is usually one of those people who gets to hear stuff. Sometimes it's it's I'm sending him specific scripts or, or showing Julia specific scripts. Sometimes it's showing actual pages. I've got yeah. a printer printing 
so excuse the noise. No, that's okay. Um, and sometimes it's it's me just verbally telling it, and I, I actually find that is a really good exercise. Mm. Um, if if you like classic jokes, you know, like almost vaudeville style set up kind of jokes that are a little more story based, you know, just, just set up punchline don't doesn't work as well for this metaphor, but. Um, and you've heard a really good joke and then you try to tell it to somebody else and it doesn't land. And then you realize like, oh, I forgot. I forgot the detail that the guy, the other guy's a doctor. Sure, sure. And the next time, like you see somebody else and you're like, oh, I'm going to tell this joke and you tell it and you realize like, I spent too much time describing the doctor's office. Mm, mm -hmm. and, then, and then you start like slowly kind of crafting this thing and getting rid of extraneous details and putting in just what needs to be there and hitting the timing so that like you finally get the laugh the more you tell the joke the better you are at telling the joke mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i find that happens with a story um if i start pitching something just as a like i, I think i know what i want to do with this issue what do you think of this I'm just asking for feedback from a friend. And maybe the first time I'm rambling and I forget to mention that the guy's a doctor. Sure, sure, sure. And I spend way too much time describing what the setting is and not, you know. And and as I'm telling diff these different people, these different first readers, multiple first readers in my life, um, I kind of slowly hone that in mm -hmm. and do just a verbal narrative. And mm -hmm. then I go, okay, I can translate that into an outline or into a script and, sure. and make it work. Um, That's a great process. So yeah, most of, that, most of that positive feedback is all um, before the thing is even drawn or at least before it's published. Yeah. Uh, yeah and I then like a... Go ahead. when it comes to the audience stuff, uh, you know, most people are gonna be polite to your face. Sure. Um, <laughs> even the people who don't like your book are just like, Oh yeah, I, I I tried your book. Um, it was cute. It was, right. it, was, oh. it, was, it was all right. You know, like or whatever. You know, like oh, it was it, the, the story was a little the, the story was simple, but I really liked the drawings. Like they'll still find some way to cushion it so that it's sure. nice. Like you said, but play. they're not going to they're not going to get in and go like, okay, so in issue four you did this and that was the wrong choice, and <laughs> this character's motivations were clear, and this panel I didn't even know which character it was. You need to be better about your consistency. Nobody's coming up to you at a convention and doing that. Sure, damn. Or at least he has with me. Um, Mike does it with me all the time. <laughs> That's how we met. Now here, yeah, but here's I, the here's I, the, here's I, the I, thing no, about Mike. Here's the thing about Mike yeah. is that he does it to me about somebody else's work and then blames me for it. That's our relationship. He gets mad at you. Right? Why didn't yeah. you tell Tom McFarland to draw that differently? He's like, remember that thing? Remember that scene in Sin City? You messed <laughs> that up so bad because you know. And I'm like, oh, sorry, man. Yeah. <laughs> you call this? You call this use of negative space? Yeah. <laughs> The, the thing Let that, me catch up the, with chat. Rich Al, hello. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Christopher John, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your company. JK has a question. Eric, do you finish your book in thumbnail form first, or do you figure out the story as you go? Whoa, that's those are... I think those are related, but not necessarily connected, which is a weird thing to say. Um, I have the story in place. I don't write a full script. I write things in, in sort of story beats. Um, which is a nightmare for my editor because he doesn't get a full script and then he's trying to sort of decipher everything as it makes sense. So simply, you were talking to me earlier just now, Dave, you were talking about how you kind of explain the story to somebody and you hone the way you tell it, right? Yeah. By the time I give, by the time I lay down the uh, story for my editor, it's, it's, I'm in that space already where I've kind of honed how to tell the story and I kind of know what highlights it, but because he needs to be able to do his job well, right? He needs to be able to also read what the, the words that are coming out of these guys' mouth, right? To see, to make sure there's character consistency, to make sure that, the, the, you know, it's landing correctly by way of punch. He is that, for he is that, even though he's not the first reader, he is that first reader before it goes out to the public, right? So yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a hint, it's fun to write, for me, it's fun to write in beats because I understand the themes that I'm trying to go for. But yeah. the critical part, at least in a story like this, um, is that 
the dialogue needs to help stand up is a, in my, in my opinion, an essential pillar of those themes, right? Um, relationships with the character relationships with each other is super mm -hmm. important to help highlight what those themes are. And it, and that's when it becomes super challenging um, for my editor because it's not a full script. He doesn't quite understand until I start writing out the dialogue bubbles for not just him, but obviously for my literer to, um, you know, to get that short up. And then he goes like, oh, no, you need to go back. <laughs> like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, like they're saying, I remember our last conversation uh, three weeks ago. They're like, you're... Your antagonist is has comes off all business for the first two issues, two and a half issues, and he's she says this line in the third or in the fourth issue that's too playful, and we spent about ten minutes looking at that line, you know, going like, what do you yeah. what do you see in that line? And he says it's the it's the it's this combination of words that is too sort of suge openly suggestive, like open to, for feedback, whereas she was sort of, you know, uh, generalissimo for the first three issues. And we were going back and forth on that. And then I said something that kind of cued him in. He goes, oh, that totally makes sense. And I said, that antagonist is Helen Mirren in its reading, right? And he said something great to me because that's how I sort of build some of my characters just to give me a voice in my head. And I don't know if you do the same, Dave, but like to, just to give a voice in my head. Yeah. And he said, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, that's uh, an amazing uh, sort of mechanism, but you have to realize nobody else knows that in context. So if Helen Mirren was to say that line, amazing, that would be great. That That's absolutely uh, on brand and in character. But unfortunately, when all they have is the, uh, the exposure of this character, and then they say this line without that he Helen Mirren context, it comes off that he says that's the reason why I made that note that it comes off a tiny bit playful, and that to me I was like, oh, I freaking get it, I get it, you know. And that's when we rewound that line back and 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 sort of, sort of rounded off that rough that rough corner. So yes, I uh, I thumbnail everything, but it's being thumbnailed based off of a um, a beats only script, if that makes any sense. Mortal V says, Malin will be mean to you if you ask him. I think that's on brand for John Malin. Uh, Let's ever says a question for you, David. David, do you work with an editor? If so, did you have one early on? So no. Um, I I started with, you know, during the self-published time, it was just me. Mm. There was, you know, it was just me. And uh, I, I mean, the book went out with, telling errors and all kinds of stuff in the self-publishing days. And then when Archaea brought me on, there wasn't any, but I mean, it was, it was such a shoelace operation. There were two full-time employees for mm -hmm. the entire publishing. Company. There was two, two full-time and then a handful of part-time. There was like a guy who did marketing and a, someone who was doing um, translate because they were importing some um, uh, French comics. And so they had somebody who was just like a translator Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that person also kind of did some editing at one point, but it was it was like just bare bones punctuation stuff. And even still, the early issues of Mouse Guard through Archaea went out with all kinds of typos. Yeah. Um, oh shit. Yeah, but it was to the point where like when when Mouse Guard became a success, and I was not used to an editor and was always skeptical of the idea of somebody else coming in and telling me what to do mm. that I didn't, didn't want. I didn't like that idea. I was, I was skeptical of it that, um, I don't know. by the time Archaea actually had enough staff for that, there was, there was kind of a like hands off David feeling because mm. they're like, look, what he's doing is working. I don't yes. know that we want with the formula um and it took me a really long time to get comfortable with the idea because there were a couple times where they started to try to get an editor to to be more involved usually those editors so i feel like there's there's different kinds of editors yes. so there are copyright style editors that are just there or copy editors checking. that are just there. yeah they're just doing punctuation spelling yeah do, do the pages line up <laughs> right mm -hmm. you know yeah. the yeah is everything actually here that's supposed to be here 
Then there's like the scheduling style editors that are calendar reminders. Mm, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, and checking, hey, can I see, can I see what you got so far? And it's not yeah. that they're going to be critical, but they just need to know you have, you know, this many, you know, at this point in the month, you do have 12 pages done or you do right. have whatever. Right. Um, and then there are the editors who are going to have opinions about content. Mm, mm. Um, suggestions whether it's subtle stuff like i think if you used this word here instead of that word it's more effective mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not copy, copy editing where it's about punctuation or spelling it is an actual change but it's not like yeah what if we did an issue that was totally different or what if we did an <laughs> sure. issue that had, sure you know more romance or what if we did an issue that had more action it's not that kind of substantive change but it is making changes. And that can go by degrees all the way up to they're trying to, you know, go like, what if you did a very special kidnapping episode? (laughs) (laughs) We've got a tie in with this other company. What if, what if the characters had product placement, you know, like it it can become that extreme. So I was was, opioid epidemic. Right. Yeah. I was always kind of leery of editor intervention And when editors started to be, and I'm going to use this term from my point of view at that time, foisted on me, Mm, mm, they were mm. generally the scheduling type. It was, it was Archaea was tired of, of books not coming out on time, not just my book, but lots of books not coming out. Generally. Right. And so they were just like, we've got to get somebody in here to like crack down and make sure these artists are actually turning in everything when they say they're going to, and we need to, we need to plan out a year in advance for what the next mouse guard release is going to be. So let's, let's corner David about when his next book is going to start and if he can Mm. keep the deadline, Mm. you know, and I, I pushed back against that. And then by the time that there was an editor around who wanted to make, uh, substantive changes, creative changes, even when they were subtle. I still like I kept them at arm's length for a really long time, mm. and and it was it was my wife Julia who kind of went like, "Look, you're never gonna, um, you're you're and and that editor and I actually didn't hit it off right away. We we had kind of a bad start. A lot of that was because it was, um, she was being pressured by people at the company to kind of like put a leash on me, right, uh, right, and get me to perform." And, uh, and she was just doing her job. Yeah. Uh, she, um, I, I said to Julia something about like, you know, I really want to warm up to her. Or I'd be nice if I had a little bit of load off or, or if there was one more person I could talk to about, you know, some of these kind of creative decisions. But, oh, I just, I, not with her because, you know, of the bad blood before. And Julia's like, look you haven't given her a chance like there's no way you know if she can be that person for you unless you actually give her some things sure so we came up with a couple projects um one of them was putting together that short story collection and another one was putting uh um, an art book together and uh and she actually came out here and stayed with us for several days to to put some of that stuff and it was just about it gave her the trust like i not even like i gave her the trust like i gifted her anything she gifted me because i actually opened my heart to the idea that maybe i'm not perfect is what it really goes down to sure Sure. and yeah great experience um and and we unfortunately didn't have too much time together after i had that uh realization because she moved on to dc Mm, mm, but mm -hmm. um her uh, her like the associate editor on the book um, was actually they were secretly dating. I don't think we even knew it at that time, or maybe we did. Anyway, um, he was going to be fully taking over, and I was like, "Well, I'm not going to make the same mistake. I'm I'm giving him full access." Yeah, right away. Yeah, and uh, even though he's now moved on to other things as well. He sure. and I have had talks about like the whole direction for multiple books of mouse guard that i haven't even started drawing oh right what's the plot here and what's right this on. character's and so this you do and... so you do have an ongoing yeah. one or not necessarily an ongoing one but with somebody that you can trust with those editorial duties yeah so the the person who now has taken so it was uh rebecca taylor was the the first one that i kind of you know opened my heart to and then mm-hmm. 
Cameron Chittick was the second one, and then he's moved on to something else. And now uh, Bryce uh, Bryce Carlson is my um, my editor now, and I think I I trust him for that kind of stuff. But I'm actually in a position right now where because I've run this stuff by so many people that mm-hmm. I'm working on the stuff that I'm working on right now, I've run it by so many people. There's not mm-hmm. really anything for him to do. Sure. <laughs> uh, so there's not sure. as much of a like, hey, you need to look at this too. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I still show him stuff way more than I ever would have in the past. But for the most part, that relationship right now is more like, um, hey, check out this cool drawing I just did. And he's like, right. that's awesome. That's a cool right. drawing. Right. I love the details in that one. Right. Oh, man, your villain, your villain is so hateable. I love that. Like that kind of stuff. <laughs> right on. Rob the Replicator yeah. is in chat. How are you doing, man? Rob is my uh, my my guide, my Sherpa through. I refer to him as that. I don't know if he finds it offensive, but I don't care because he's walked me through some of the most impassable bit of mountain terrain when it comes to understanding what it means to crowdfund. So I'm always glad when he drops by in chat. So thank you for being your man. Uh, he says, the word editor has a negative connotation for artists that have worked in the mainstream because in a lot of cases, they would ruin books slash storytelling. These days, they are needed by new creators. And I think this goes back to something that you had said earlier, Dave, which is which is, there are, for the most part, in my experience when working in the main, in mainstream comics, the kind of editors that I've, that I have dealt with are often the schedule schedule wrangling kind, you know? It was never, I was never put in a position in which I was doing something and then they went and looked at the art and said, oh, hey, you kind of need to switch this around because it doesn't make much sense X, Y, and Z. Now, I've never had um, personal experience from the from the narrative slash writing end because I've never wrote for mainstream publishing, but I would hope that there is a position, I don't think it's, there would be now because just the nature of comics isn't, isn't pivoting around that, but I would hope that if there was a sort of a, an editor slash art director, they would have the pedigree to be able to make those notes to their artists. But to Rob's point, it comes off negative because I don't know if they clear they have a clear understanding of what their jobs are, their tasks and their duties are for how to service a script, how to service a, a series, right? My editor, um, my experience with Joe, his name is Joe Fulton, who's editing Arc Athena. The, my first conversation with Joe took s- several hours, I would say five, maybe as many as six. Our first day sitting down as I explained the miniseries to him, right? And he, all he kept doing was asking more questions. And I, 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 was, I was clear with him. I said, there's going to be times when you ask me questions about motivations or, this, or specific plot points or scenarios in which my best answer is, I don't know. Yeah. There, that's that's valuable to me, right? Yeah. Because oftentimes, if he asks a question, it's coming from a space of like you're you're probably gonna want to at the very least just lightly cover that so it's a base that's covered so because you know your audience is going to be asking for it, right? right. So or, I inherit or the heads up that at some point, even if you leave this thing vague about that character's motivation, you are going to need to make it clear in the next issue or the next sure. story. Or Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And as a matter of fact, he just sent me a note earlier today saying this section needs to be massaged because f- the reader is just going to be so um, confused as to why these two things sim- seemingly are happening at the same time. And the point behind that is, Joe just keeps me accountable. Does that make sense? Like Joe isn't there to sort of like, well, I think there should be a fucking dinosaur, you know, because dinosaurs are awesome. You know, like that that level of like editorial heavy handedness. When I told him, that's the reason why I think he took the time and care to sit down and really listen to that story for as long as he did. Because his task was to say, remember when you told me this is a, this is the themes about this, the, the main story is about the 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 concept of um, responsible leadership and accountability you're not landing that right now but i think there's a way that you can and here is a suggestion here is a space in which you can do it you know and how did that come into your life i was introduced to him by uh uh, by uh by rob who's in chat right now he is editing another book um from mutual friend of ours by the name of uh, michael bancroft and joe was so busy Right. And, I, and jokingly, I was on Bancroft's stream and I said, 
you know, hey, maybe Joe, one of these days, you, you know, if you had time, and Joe kind of politely just said, yeah, I'm, you know, he, he, he did it in such a way that he was like, he was communicating that he was busy. But then I said, you know, a, a few months later, as many as two, I think, but as few as one, I reached out to him again and I said, are you interested in this? Because I know that there's a value to it, right? And I think it was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't know if he was clear about it, but I think I almost had to pitch the idea to him, you know? Like, here's what I'm working on. See if you have time. And if you have time, it would be great. And it just happened to be, it was something that, that sort of caught his eye and he thought, oh, I can help, right? And I think that's where in, in, I think in spirit, a lot of these guys are coming from. They're like, I think we can help yeah. you. And I think this is the way we can do it. So, so yeah, that's how I that's think how the I, way, the way that he came into your life in that you sought him out, you were yes. like, hey, I think I, I need help in this regard. Um, one, it shows you're open to it. Yes. And two, it's also now you're getting to pit, like once you're open to the idea of like, oh, I need some help, you are you are purposely picking this one person out because of experiences you know with other creators that he's worked with or your mm -hmm. experience with him or whatever. You're just like, yeah, I think I want to work with this guy. And I think yeah. that's the that's the way that you can be pretty self-assured that editor doesn't become a bad word mm. is if they're not being foisted on you. Mm. And if they're mm. not, if those editors also aren't going to be the calendar keepers. Sure. You know, that are just whipping you about getting it done on time. They're the people who want to help you make the book better. Yes. Um, and that's not to say that, like, at the big two, you're not going to get editors oh, sure. who are just to help you make the thing better. But when there is a corporate structure, there is always going to be the chance that the editor has a different agenda or a corporate agenda or a corporate tie in or, yes. you know, yes. whatever, whatever the company's rules are about yep. cigars drinking <laughs> sure, or, sure 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 you know exposed yeah. thighs or whatever that that stuff's going to come along with that editor but if it's right. something that you're picking out specifically for your project unless you're a really bad judge of character you're probably not going to go wrong with getting an editor mm. Mm, yeah and i i yeah and there was i mean there was there was still what's great about uh, our professional relationship is that he says, you know, hey, I'm going to make these, uh, I'm going to make these suggestions. I'm gonna, there's gonna be times when I pick things out that don't necessarily make sense. Now, it was never sort of like, hey man, you're kind of locked in and we're gonna have you forever. It was almost like, if this works, let's continue working with each other, you know? If this makes yeah. sense for you, let's continue working with each other, which is, I think, a pretty high bar on how you conduct yourself professionally to say like, if I'm helpful for you, definitely let's continue, but if not, then this doesn't make any sense for either of us, you know? I right. can allocate neither my time to something else. Beating, yeah, neither one of us should be beating our heads against the wall because right. of this relationship. Right, right, which was great. And it, it's been very, very fruitful, at least for me, it's been very fruitful. Because again, there's things that I'm so close to the story, I'm so close to the beats that it makes a lot of sense. But then you have that critical eye that's there to help you, not to sort of do those, you know, gotcha moments. You know what I mean, Dave? Where they're like, ah, look how... Yeah. Or this is executed. It's more coming uh, coming from a place of like, I get where you're coming from, but this is how we can tighten the screw a bit, you know? Yeah. And there there have been times where um, editors have told me, uh, "Hey, looking through this, I think I think this reads better if you say it like this, yes. or I think this would work better if you do it like this." Yes. But ultimately, it's okay the way it is. So. Every, you know, what do you think about that? Like yes, there are times exactly. where, and, and not, I mean, obviously because it's a creator owned book, it's always going to be, you know, basically what I want to do. Right. But there are times where they're even going like, I think this is a six of one, half a dozen of the other kind of scenario. Mm. I just wanted to, I just wanted to show you what the other version of this is. That's it. That's it. That's but perfectly we said. Mine, or we use yours. It's going to be fine. Yes. And then there are times where they go, hey, this isn't working. Yeah. And this needs to get fixed before it goes out. Right. Whose solution we use, whether it's, you know, something you come up with, we come up with together, or I come up with whatever, you know, we can figure that out as we go, but this needs to get fixed. Right. And that's something right. that the, some of the early issues I was, so going back to the idea of like fans, getting feedback from fans, 
the feedback that I got, especially in those early issues, was I would I would go to a convention and someone would be telling me how much they liked the book. Mm-hmm. And in describing something about the book or who their favorite character was, yeah. I would pick up on they got something wrong. And not huh. like a tiny detail, but like the gender of a character. Huh, okay. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you know, with mice and everything, I thought that was crystal clear because in my head, I know that character's male. Right, right. You're right. The name is vague enough. It could go either way. And I never use the pronoun he anywhere. Sure, sure. Oh, I didn't make that clear. Right. I should make sure I put in a, a pronoun somewhere. Just, to, right. you know, not force it and not put out a press release. By the way, <laughs> this character's male. Right. But just, yeah, at some point, like, Oh, yeah, I have to. I have to find a way in casual conversation to make it obvious. Yeah, that's great. And and there were other things like that about what the role of the mouse guard was, or how how the Gwendolyn, the matriarch of the guard, how she, what what her role is with all of the other mouse settlements. Like, is she a queen? Mm-hmm. Is she a military commander? Is she? You know, what is she? And it was like I thought I made that clear, but maybe not. Maybe I have right. to reinforce that. Right. So I would kind of do these little course corrections based on feedback that the audience was giving me that they didn't even realize they were giving me. Right. Right. Yeah. To, for me, when, when, um, when Joe, what I really understood, I mean, I, I had an appreciation for Joe's value, but when it was put into full exercises, when he was helping to highlight, I was not helping my, the themes of the book when he was like, this is great. These are these are these are amazing beats that's happening between these two characters, which you know it's a team book, right? It's like X Men Gold and X Men Blue, right? But unfortunately, at the, well, it's it's typical Claremont um, uh, Claremont writing, which is yeah, sure you get to have this big inferno fight, but at the end of the day, the story is about Storm and the story is about Forge, you know. So mm-hmm. like you need to land the point of this as you are as you're telling this theme, you're talking about this theme through the lens of these two characters. And yes, you're kind of doing it, but you're doing it lightly, right? And here, we need more of it. And I said, absolutely, I get it, you know? And so that from there, we devised how we can help land. Now, he was already he was already thinking in parallel. He's, he, was, he was very big and not being destructive in the concept of like change these panels and redraw things, right? That wasn't, that wasn't part of his MO at all. It was more like, how do we then help guide that theme so that it you know it hits the nail on the proverbial head a little bit harder but i was of the attitude right i was of the attitude it was like joe if i gotta draw more pages i'll draw more pages and it, you know like we were in this space where joe was like i'm never gonna ask you to redraw anything or draw more pages and like fuck that shit if it's gonna be good if it's gonna be for the sake of the story i'd rather land the story because you know i can draw the action stuff all day i can draw a bunch of superheroes beating up each other and shooting lasers at each other but at the end of the day if my you know we were talking about this in in in, in broad broadly Dave, like as far as like what's motivating us telling these stories is it the oh is it just getting it out there and is that the victory Right. For me, the ex- the whole entire exercise is to get better as a storyteller um, from the, from the narrative perspective. Right. And if it means I'm missing that, and there's a guy, there's a component in place, there's a mechanism in place as an editor that'll help me learn that better. Of course, I'm going to draw more pages. Like I don't care, you know. Yeah, I think that the only danger in what you're saying is to first-time creators that will spin wheels by for sure. drawing pages and then yeah, for sure. Like, Get that across i have to redraw those pages and then at the end of the year they have you know 10 pages they, right they've drawn 30 oh for sure for sure yeah no, i'm 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 not in the business of telling people like draw it until it's perfect i'm sp- specifically talking right. about my personal experience in regards to yeah. this project you know like i think there's a almost like a movie making parallel where um you know, if, if something's not working storytelling wise, is there a way to edit this without yeah. reshooting anything? That's where, so that's like where Joe movie, is coming from. That's where Joe is coming from. You like ADR, right? You would, you would, you would maybe have a, a, even if you don't have the character on screen in, in, in the movies, you would have them just off screen, but you'd have a new line dubbed in. Right. Where you right. Could tell, you know, you're getting like a reaction shot of who's seeing it. 
right from some other scene but um or you know earlier or later in that same scene you're just using the reaction shot of you know character b but mm -hmm. it's character a voice and mm -hmm. then that way you don't have to worry about syncing up lips or anything you can do the same kind of thing in comics except you you can drop in a word balloon or yes. a narration box or a whatever sure. anyways yeah the a to comparison then there's the like occasionally movies will need a couple reshoots right they're not shooting the whole movie right we're just redoing maybe the end or right. this we if we add a scene right here in the middle just a couple like eric we want you to draw three more pages it goes right smack dab in the middle there we go that's it yeah. you don't have to redraw the whole damn comic just yep. this one little part to make it better and it should always be about the minimum impact of any kind of like redo or extra effort to make it work and yes. then you take what you learned about that and apply it to the next issue so that hopefully you have fewer ADR style moments Absolutely. or reshoots or whatever. If you've gotten to the point where you have to redraw the issue, you're borked. Like you're, yeah, you were in yeah, bad no, shape. And you're going to be in, in some ways worse shape by the end of this. I agree, and I, that helps to highlight. This is a very great point. Dave. Thanks for that. I think it's it helps to highlight how you, in a way, did not shore it up to begin with where you're in uh, you, when you're in absolute recovery mode you know like all the time and always you know that's like that's the nightmare scenario that i would hope nobody has to go through because at the end of the day you do want to see this thing you know come to pass you do want to see it published you do want to see it distributed so that you can, the idea is that the more you do it the better you get at it right but it goes yeah, to show yeah. how um you know the foundational stuff at the very beginning wasn't shored up very it wasn't shored up enough because you're now starting to, you're able to still punch massive holes where you're quote unquote reshooting everything and you can't even release it as is, you know? Yeah, um, I have yeah. a question I mean, in yeah. chat here. says, uh, Oh, go ahead. Brandon Wallace says, Eric, have you thought about doing a book in this new structure of mainstream book publishers? Uh, for example, Penguin, Harper, etc. getting into comics. I wonder how the editorial style's different. Have I ever thought about doing a book for those publishers? No. Um, I think think I'm enjoying the opportunity to do this on my own. And I've, I had mentioned this for a handful of people, and I think that's one of the things that really sort of uh, um, uh, fascinates me about your journey, David, because it still feels like how I felt back when I was trying to um, uh, break into the comic book industry. I think one of the things that really soured me is when, you know, it's, it's, to, it's this is really sort of, this is really stock and basic, but it's like, as soon as I realized how the sausages were being made, my fervor, my love for drawing comics kind of went away, you know, or at least it lessened, you know, or like making comics, you know, it, it, it's, I don't know, like all the, the, the rose colored lenses went away and I was like, this isn't fun anymore. And just recently, I think just as recently as, you know, a little bit before the pandemic and the wall came down and nobody could do anything, it started to drive me again. I started realizing, wait, I still love drawing comics. I just don't like drawing those comics, you know? I still, I just don't have a love for the comics that I'm seeing that's out there right now. So rather than say, eh, I'm not really interested, how about I make the thing that I want to see? You would, yeah, you want, yeah. yeah. Right? You make the, it's the, yeah. And be, it's similar the, to, what's the quote? It's, uh, like be, be the, the change. change in the world. Yeah, it's, right. it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's the same, con like, and any time Mike and I, when Mike streams, I used to, I would still, I still do, but I, I join him and we'd be talking about whatever pop culture things going on. We talk about these comic book stories, movie stories, what have you. And I'd, I'd catch myself kind of complaining, you know, like, you know, we were talking about Car Captain Marvel earlier, and I'd be so critical about that movie. And eventually I just heard myself enough times where I'm like, oh, that's enough. <laughs> you know, like, I'm tired of listening to myself talk about how... Yeah this thing could work if they did this, this thing could work if they did that. I just rather go do something about it rather than just be from the out, from the sidelines, always yelling down into the field, how they can be so much better at their, at their craft, you know, at their sport. So I think, to, I, to, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say to answer Brandon's question, the reason why I, I had no motivation to go do something like that is because that just takes me back into a space that I don't care for. And right now I'm so inspired to do this thing on my own, I have no desire to 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 go go the other way. You know, I'm sorry, Dave, I cut you off. Yeah, go ahead. I think I think that if you did go with, you know, I think it's the difference between creator owned and working 
on somebody else's characters. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, I, I and maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, when you were like, hey, I got dis disenfranchised and, and, and bored and, and had all the joy taken away, I'm thinking of, like, those incredible books that you did, but the things that you did at Marvel, where you guys tried something different. It looked different. It felt different. I remember telling you after I read Iron Man Enter the Mandarin, I wish mm. all Iron Man comics were like that. I would be <laughs> buying you. Iron Man. Thanks, dude. But I remember you telling me, holy shit, the amount of fan hate pushback we got from hardcore Iron Man fans or hardcore Spider-Man fans that go, Kennedy can't draw this right, or this is sure. wrong, or this yeah. doesn't feel like the character. Why are you trying something different? This I want my thing to be vanilla and the same and the way it always is. And that you were trapped in this, like, I can't do anything other than just regurgitate the last 60 years of comics. Mm, mm. I can't try anything. And if I do, I get flamed for it. Mm. Um, and I would think like, yeah, any, anytime you're like, I just want to do my own thing and be allowed to do my own thing. Like you've already opened up that you're, you're open to feedback. You're open yeah. to people being critical of, of what you're doing. If it's in the, the vein of making it better. Yeah, it's two pieces, though. I mean, that's interesting that you say that because upon reflection, years and years later, right, there's a part of me that was bullheaded enough to think I want to draw something different for mainstream comics. But now I also look back and I go, I understood that IP. And there is something to be said about being a steward for the expectation of the fan base. And it's not to say everything must be the same for the next 50 years. It is to say, have respect, have enough respect to understand what Iron Man was about and not necessarily break it, just bend it a little bit, you know? I have a respect, yeah, yeah. I have that much more respect for it now than I did back then where I would struggle about like, why don't I have the, the liberty and the freedom to be as creative as possible and yada yada and why, why is there so much fan backlash and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely accurate in my reaction to it, but now I can actually look back and have and amend it just a tiny bit, you know? I think, we, I know you and I are both big X-Men fans. If you look at all the different you know, kind of seminal eras of X Men. Sure. They come in with a change. Yes, I agree. I agree. It, like an art, an art direction change, a I tonal agree. change. Yeah. A, a, a team shift change. Hey, we're totally changing who are X Men right now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. You know, yep. with the first one being like the giant size team. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know it was because the, the original team, the original book was on the brink of cancellation. You know, yep. the, the original yep. book was not doing well. And they, the, the, the new team was a revitalization effort. But even still, like, the idea of, yeah, we're going to publish the X-Men, except none of the X-Men are in it. Right, right. And we're Not, doing all new... Like, that's a huge... Oh, and somebody else is drawing it. Right, right, right. No, you absolutely. Know, I mean... It's so different than what was there, and yet it's this one that we herald. And then when that happened again with the X-Men at a later time, with you know, whoever it was, Paul Smith, or... Yeah. You know... You know Barry Windsor Smith or, or Ramita or, or Jim Lee or Joe Matt or you know Art Adams. Take your pick of, of, of who's who's your ex artist of choice for for those big turning points. That's what made it great. Yes. And I feel like you went in there with both Iron Man and Spider Man. I it's not that. Like, yep. going like I'm going to change it all. I hate Spider Man, and here's the way he should be so that it's better. You went in there going, I love Spider-Man, and I right. want to push part of the character that's already there because that works to my strengths. Or Correct. I want Correct. to do this with Iron Man because it, it, this plays to my strengths and it's cool. It's in the it's in the vein. I know you even played with doing an X-Men story, and I, yep. I would love to see that X-Men story just from the vantage point of I know you're a fan of the X-Men. Yeah, it'd be yeah. very interesting to see what parts of that you would you would raise up on a pedestal and what parts would vanish away what would be your focus what would be the themes what are the what is a eric kennedy x-men story actually about i would love to see that oh dude but i, I mean but I the tap yeah. machine is working against you yeah um, but here's the thing 
I'm leveraging now everything that you just said right now because I, you know, there was a point in which I really, really wanted to have a a love letter to the X Men. And I said like, I would love to be able to draw that. That's the thing that got me into comics. That's the thing that's helped me maintain my my comic books love. And then after a while, I realized, oh, these are turn and these characters are no longer the ones that I can that I'd like to read about. And that's when I kind of put the X Men down and said I don't need it anymore. But that X Men story, that that the want, that desire to tell a good X Men story was still inside of me, right? In the in the in the best sort of you know tribute, right? And that's what I'm doing with Arc Athena. Arc Athena is that, right? Through and through, is that the X Men story that I that I'm not allowed to tell because X Men, because because it's Marvel is very different from the X Men that I grew up with, you know. Rob is giving me crap for uh, not paying attention to chat. Eric, I'm giving your chat interaction today a 1 out of 10. Get out of here, Rob. Who was your favorite artist on the X-Men comics? It was Paul Smith. Followed very closely by Jim Lee, then Mark Silvestri. Um, what am I missing? I didn't miss anything. Did I miss anything? Eric and I are drinking for the same mantra pool. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Part of my soul disappears every time Eric erases that arm. This arm is annoying. This arm is, is supposed to communicate that there's a chain knuckle wrapped around it, and I want to be able to communicate that um, that weight and that tension, but I'm not getting it, and these two characters are uh, almost the same size as each other, so I'm going to have to fix it much later. Probably not on stream, because I'm fascinated by whatever it is that we're talking about. Am I caught up? Yeah, no, yeah. I've been fully invested into uh, listening to you guys break down process. So if I've been quiet, it's just because I've been... I mean, I'm like a sponge soaking it all in. Right on. My three favorite people in one place is so great. It's Nolan, our good friend Nolan. Jason Aaron said he didn't love comics anymore after Ghost Rider. Uh-oh, that's the bad idea to let that guy write the X-Men line. Um, Eric and Shelby need to have a speed draw. I, I, um, I, I, I give the title over to Shelby. Shelby wins. And I think I'm caught up, man. Get out of here, Rob. Jeez <laughs> Louise. What the hell? Is that, is that criticism? I love it. I love it. That guy keeps me on the straight and narrow. Partly tongue-in-cheekly, but also partly realistically. First time I saw a Kennedy Spider-Man, I thought, well, Spider-Man is never going to look cooler than that. You are one of three people. One of the three is my mom. <laughs> there was more than that. There was more than that, Eric. People could not that could not burn that comic book fast enough, but that was a lot of fun. But that was also a part of me that thought, like, look at this young, like I look back at that work and I thought, like, look at this young punk, look at this jerk, just like, you know, peeing all over this IP, like not understanding, not understanding the sort of the landscape of that version of Spider-Man. I couldn't, I couldn't tell that spy version of Spider-Man, that story of Spider-Man with that style back then, because it was all about John Romita Jr. and Mark Bagley and, you know, sort of a sort of very ref a specifically refined look to him. It was no longer the time of Eric Larson and Todd McFarlane and, you know, Squatch and Stretch people. But that's the stuff that I loved, and I wanted to introduce that, or at yeah. least reintroduce that. And the fans just weren't reacting to it favorably. Now that's that's a bit of self-awareness that I could have dug into a little bit deeper, but it's also helped me to understand that's no longer the environment that I want to play in, if that makes yeah, any it sense. It would have been so stiff and terrible if you'd done that. You're, sure. You were you were, uh, you were were bringing about, there was like a little bit of Art Adams in there, a little bit of Chris sure. Bacchello, and then, sure. and you and I have talked about in person about this, about your, your time on Aeon Flux. Yeah. How that yeah. informed being able to distort anatomy to show movement yeah and yeah. when you're talking about a character like spider-man i mean i thought it was i thought it was a perfect opportunity to do that right like, gotta do. it is it is i mean spider-man doesn't move the way any human being should move like even when they even when you know the greats do it they're still doing in a proximity of it i mean listen man you see the way todd mcfarlane would bend spider-man in half that was unrealistic but you know you take it in because he's spider-man Right. I mean, even when right. even when John Cassidy draws him, there's there's a pushing of the extremes of form. Right. You know, and he's drawing rigid, anatomically correct human beings, but there's still that push. It, yeah. If there's ever a character to do that on, it's Spider-Man. You would. Think now, if so. you want to tell like a very realistic, you know, like war story style thing with the Punisher, 
I get that that realism only reinforces the story. Yes. Yes. And maybe if you had done a, <laughs> if you had done a Punisher story where you had done Anne Flux style anatomy, <laughs> that out have worked as well. But with Spider Man, give me a break. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 I'm with David Peters. David Peterson on this. And, yeah. and, and the and the Iron Man story, I think that's a counterintuitive one because the sense. armor the armor should be rigid. Oh sure, sure. And then I was squashing and, yeah. and stretching the hell out of that. <laughs> and well, but and yet there's a so this is a weird analogy, but there's a um there was a role playing game of uh, Robotech um, that was put out by a company called Palladium. And I used to play sure. a lot of Palladium role playing games when I was in high school. And then in college, a friend of mine was like, let's play that again, except, and because we were all like, nah, but Palladium games have some real flaws when it comes to the combat system. And he's like, I've got a solution. Yeah. And he came up with this combat system where uh, instead of going turn by turn, like, okay, you all get six attacks per melee. So, Eric, what's your first attack? Right, right, right. We go, what's your first attack? And we're just going to go around in order, deal with all those. Then, okay, what's your second attack? What's your... And now we've had one round of melee when we go all the way around, you know, six times or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like, no, I want you to tell me all you, all the things that you're doing. Like, if you have six attacks, tell me all of them. And with Macross, you're like, okay, I'm going to fire two blasts. I'm going to turn into guardian mode. I'm going to fly over here. I'm going to launch two missiles. And I'm going to save a couple attacks maybe for, for blocking, for defense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. everybody did that. And it made the game move at this frenetic pace that felt like an anime combat scene. Sure, sure. It was like, oh, we're breaking the rules, but we're doing it in a way that actually makes this one more fun, and right. two, like the source material. And so, when you're thinking of an armored character who's able to do what Iron Man does and move at at speeds and crash through walls and you know all this kind of stuff that was happening in those issues, bending the armor to show the motion actually enforces the movement and it reinforces that he is not move this is not armor like a medieval suit of armor where you have to walk slow right this technological armor that actually allows him to move faster than a normal person that allows him to fly through walls and and you know have stuff crumble around him he's not he he's he's not like locked in a concrete block right right let me catch up with chat really really quick uh, Nolan says, I haven't heard Palladium in so long. I had all of those Robotech books. That's great. JK has actually asked this er question earlier. Sorry if I let it slip through the cracks. Eric is a beginner comic artist. Should I focus more on the popular style, inking plus colors, or can I pursue my strengths painterly style and still find work success? So there's a, there's a, there is no easy answer for that because I can't look into that really transparent crystal ball to say, Dude, if you continue to use your painterly style, you're going to be able to find success. For me, and this is this, I want to caveat this what it what it's been for me, and this goes back to what Dave is just talking about right now. I think the reason why I give myself a pass in doing those Iron Man, you know, comic books exercise or the Spider Man, the way I drew Spider Man, is because at the end of the day, I wanted to have fun, right? It was supposed to be a fun exercise, a fun job for me to do comics and to be able to draw. Now that's a different, it could be a completely different metric for you. If the, if the, if the goal is to get well, a, a, a paying gig in, in comics or as an illustrator, or what have you, then there's gonna be things in yours, in those spaces, in that decision-making that's gonna inform how you should move forward. But for me, I wanted to have fun drawing those comics, and I wanted to draw it in such a way that it would optimize for the best version of fun, and that was one. Of, that's the style that I was utilizing. So, to answer your question, should you focus more on the popular style? It all depends what your goals are. If your goals are to to land a popular book in which a popular style is integral, if not critical, then the answer would probably be yes. You would hedge your bets and say probably, right? But if you're saying yeah. I, I would get so much more growth, and that's the metric that you could decide to guide yourself by. I would get so much more growth 
as an artist and an illustrator and storyteller by using pursuing your strength, which is a more painterly style. If you get something more out of that, then use that. And I know that's sort of a you know sitting on the fence, wishy washy way of, um, uh, of answering, but I really believe that's the that's the only way you can make that decision clear and most importantly, a decision that you will feel good about moving forward. Does that make any I sense? Can be I can be more definitive for Jake. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do anything just because it's popular. Mm. Oh, I like that. I think well, you uh, earlier with your Magnolia uh, yeah. reference. Don't do yeah. the don't do the thing just because it's popular. I think that I so that's my definitive part. The, I'm going to go a little bit wishy washy in kind of a way that Eric did, but I, the way I would measure it is there's going to be a trade off, and what you need to find is the best combination. You need to find the center of your your Venn diagram where you are producing your best work. The, the best version of the work you can do right now, what is that? Is it painterly or is it more traditional ink plus colors? What's so it's the what's the best work you can do? What is it does that work uh, bring you any kind of joy? Like if you absolutely hate doing one, but it's your best work, that's not a good solution. Um find a way to make that work more enjoyable or develop the stuff you do find more enjoyable so that it lives up to the quality of the other stuff. And then thirdly, can you get a book done or a story done in that way? If it's going to take you 10 years to finish one book doing it painterly, that's, that's something you have to weigh in. Like, is this going to kill you effort wise? But if you can find the center of that diagram, maybe it's not the most efficient way, but you can still get it done in a, in a relatively normal amount of time. Are you producing the work that you're proud of in terms of quality? And are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? Or do you hate it? If, if you can get those three things to line up, you're in the sweet spot. There you go. Thanks for that. Appreciate it, Dave. Appreciate the question, JK. Hello, Mindy Lee. Mindy does everything well. Is that, is that the Mindy Lee? The Mindy Lee. Can we get a, Mindy? can we get a, what do you call it? A, a link to her Instagram or social media? Of course we can. My point of reference, my true north, my north star. Hello, Miss Mindy Lee. Thank you for being here. I know it's shot and fraud, but it's comforting to watch other people erase things after 30 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I erase it because it's not communicating well. That's my primary reason. If it's if it sucks in its communication, regardless of how well I drew it previous, then it's not worth the time to take into a finish. Eric, what software are you using to broadcast? Those chat highlights are different from the StreamYard template. Yeah, I'm oper you know, I have a Mac at home. So this thing is called Ecamm Live. It's a paid app, but it does all the pretty little things that's happening on screen right now. So not your traditional StreamYard, um, StreamYard subscription. Definitely not the same look as you've seen in uh, in other streams. But I'm appreciative of it because it gives my stream um, a, a a unique look. It, it does. Says, Found you. Thanks to Denicola. Thank you so much for uh, shouting me out, Mike. Always. I think that's it. We've run our two hours. I think this is an opportunity for me to excuse myself because that was an amazing conversation. So first, let me thank our guest, uh, uh, David Peterson. Thank you so much for all your insight, your history, your sort of uh, feedback for, for everybody that's in chat. Um, I love your, your um, frankness, your straightforwardness. Really appreciate that. Can we please uh, throw up all of um, Dave's information in as far as his Twitch TV? Right. If you're not already following Dave in uh, on his social media, please do so. You can find him on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. Is it both Mouse Guard in in both instances, yep. Dave? Yep. Mouse Guard, yep. right? Instagram.com forward slash Mouse Guard, Twitter.com forward slash Mouse Guard. If you're not already, um, if you've not visited his website, please do so. MouseGuard.net. Um, what else, Dave? Is it uh, Twitch.tv forward slash? What is it? And then my name, uh, David Peterson. And David my name, Peterson. The 
The last name Peterson is all E's for the vowels. Peterson. It's not Peterson. It's Peterson. Right. Um, I, and I you stream. stream I, yep. Go Wednesday, ahead. And then I also stream the first Friday of every month for mm -hmm. a community draw along. Um, mm -hmm. And this Friday, is one of those. It's called Draw the Extinct. And we. Uh, I, I throw out some some prompts with uh, combinations of different animals, and then we all make up a, a fictional animal together. Um, and I work on mine on that Friday stream. You guys can work at home on yours. You have over the weekend to finish it up, and then on my regularly scheduled stream on Monday at the at the end of that, we will look in the Discord and look up all the at everybody's progress and what people have done, and we we hand out a few prizes. That's awesome. That's great. Prizes even. Holy cow. That's great. Yeah. Like okay, the thanks. original the original pencil drawing to my piece and some stuff like that. That's awesome, dude. Um yeah. okay, if you're not uh, if you're not already following my good friend Michael DiNicola, please do so. He's on twitch.tv forward slash Michael DiNicola. You can also follow him on his Instagram and on Twitter under that same name, Instagram.com, twitter.com forward slash Michael DiNicola. He streams Monday Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. That Friday stream is um, reserved for doing sort of a, uh, a podcast slash what's happened in nerdum and pop fiction this week. All right. It's, uh, is that, am I capturing that right, Mike? Yeah, you, know, you nailed it right in the head, man. Let's right get ready to talk about Loki. Oh, that's right. That's right. A very, very entertaining across the board. A little bit on the, uh, on the, what would you say, the rated R side when you're streaming, Mike? I love it. Adult for sure. I'm into it. I'm into it. Um, if you're not already following me on my um, my social media, please do so. Instagram.com, Twitter.com forward slash Eric Kennedy. Please sign up for my newsletter. I have a crowdfunding campaign that's going to be launching the first, second week, first or second Tell week of that. September. Right? Say again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please sign Tell up for that. the uh, please sign up for the newsletter. Eric Kennedy dot com forward slash arc dash Athena dash info. I N F O. Um, once you sign up for that newsletter at the end of this month, which is, hey, that's going to be in the day, correct? Yes. Yeah, in a couple Last days, we will, be hand, we, will be, we will be collating all of the, in, um, all the emails that have signed up for the newsletter. We'll be giving away one of these fancy little um, busts, these like prototype busts of my main character from my book to you as a thank you for supporting me. And we're going to do that again at the end of July, another one at the end of August until campaign launch. What else is there? I think that's it, right? So oh, if you're not, uh, if, uh, yeah, if you would uh, like to buy an original piece of art from me, please go to EssentialSequential.com. I think I'm there with a bunch of amazing artists. If you don't end up getting something from me, I'm sure you'll find an artist to your taste. If you have any questions, reach out to my art dealer, Jason Schachter. He'd be more than happy to help you out. Come back next Tuesday. We'll do this again at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Is that That's it? That's right. Did I say everything Thanks. right? And David, David, yeah. you. Yeah, are thank you so much, David. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate so your time, man. Yeah. Great thank you, download thank you. of knowledge, dude. Okay, <laughs> that's you. it. I've, I've, I've got to go pee now. So good night, everybody. Bye. Yeah, yeah it's pee time. Goodbye, everybody.